All right. It's just overcast and rainy. Good afternoon, everyone. We are ready to begin today's county board work session, where today we're going to be covering uh, two discrete and uh, different topic areas. First, a report out from the 26th and Old Dominion uh, Task Force, a group that concluded its work in April. <clears throat> and then we'll also be uh, devoting the second part of our work session time this afternoon to uh, discussing the recently completed Columbia Pike Commercial Market Study. Uh, but first up on the agenda is the 26th and Old Dominion Task Force Report. Colleagues, you will remember that this group concluded and provided us a report in the middle of April of this year, but this is our opportunity to actually uh, have that report brought to life by its uh, chair, Noah Seinman, who will present uh, the workings of the task force and more specifically their recommendations for us to consider moving forward after Mr. Simon does his presentation. We'll have uh, time for questions and answers to understand fully the report. There is no action required of, of us at this time other than to accept the report, but hopefully we uh, put Mr. Simon through his paces and do our own due diligence to make sure we fully understand uh, the recommendations that were contained therein. And uh, by virtue of introduction to Mr. Simon, it's fortunate that he is uh, here in this room for the second time in the last uh, 20 hours uh, last night as part of our recognition for advisory commissions and managerial committees we uh, took some time to recognize people who had gone above and beyond through their uh, commitment to civic engagement and Mr. Seinman through the 26th and Old Dominion task force as we noted last night had quite the difficult task dealing with a pretty sticky county issue that had the requisite divergence of stakeholder interests that was almost the easy part of it. In addition to the divergent stakeholder interests, uh, there was a fair amount of uh, technical uh, getting up to speed that members of the task force, including Mr. Seinman, uh, had to uh, engage in with understanding Department of Environmental Services operations currently at the site and future plans. So in addition, in addition to that technical competence, uh, there's also then the fundamental idea of dealing with limited resources and coming up with constructive ideas to uh, move forward what is the public approach to uh, managing and developing that site in the future. So we very much appreciate the complexity of the task that you had and the skill with which you guided the task force, and it should be noted, you'll probably do it more formally, but there are members of the task force who are in attendance this afternoon. We welcome you. And Mr. Schwartz, before we begin, um, do you have any opening words that you'd like to say? Yes, I'd like to welcome Noah Simon. <laughs> okay. With that, I'll turn it over to Noah Simon. Great, thank you. I think before we get started, um, we do have members of the task force here that I'd like to introduce. Uh, Elisa Cowan, Al Diaz, Dr. Elizabeth Guerin, David Howell, David Palmer, Ann Wilson. Um, we have some honorary members, uh, Jackie Wilson and Richard Lolich as well, who all of these folks gave their time, talent, and energy through six months of difficult work. And this is, although I'll be presenting today, these are not my views. These are the views of the task force and the group behind me that really are such talented people who give so much of their, their energy and commitment to the county. So I wanted to do that. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Mr. Schwartz, senior staff, thank you for having me here today to talk about military assistance to Ukraine. No. <laughs> Sorry, that's the wrong meeting. That's my day job. Not bad. 26 and Old Dominion. As you see up there, that is the study area that we have. Um, uh, just so we can all be on the same page here, this is obviously Old Dominion Drive. This was the old salt dome. Uh, the star next to it is the current uh, temporary facility. Um, what we have up here is Marymount University. The trailhead is here. Uh, Missionhurst obviously here. So just so you have your bearings, this is a 7.6 acre parcel of land um, that includes resource protected areas. So I think that will, well, I know that will come into play as we talk um, through this. I want to briefly set the stage. I think it's important to talk about our methodology, how we did our work before we get to what we did. 
um, get to our findings and most importantly, our recommendations. This is your meeting, not mine. So while I want to answer all the questions before you have them, of course, interrupt me at any time. And I will try to be brief, which is difficult for me. Um, setting the stage in 2015, I do want to bring us back there. Uh, there was a thought at the time to perhaps put a fire station on this site, um, as everyone in this room recalls. Uh, that was a fairly contentious process, and to the board's credit then, they stood up a, a Fire Station 8 task force. Um, to my knowledge, that fire station is going to remain where it is now. Um, I think everyone's excited about that. But a couple of things came out of that. One very positive, which was there was a commitment by a board member and then reaffirmed by this board that there would be at least a one-acre park. That park was undefined, um, but there was that commitment. And again, in October of 18, you all reaffirmed that commitment as well as that commitment that you made to us during some correspondence that you sent. The other thing coming out of it was not so positive, and it was it basically provided a foundation for mistrust of those areas of, of local government to some degree. Um, that's going to happen any time a new idea is introduced. We can certainly look to the school district, and you know they go through that regularly. Um, but that, that's the context at the start. If we fast forward then to 2018, I uh, ran into a couple of bumps again. Um, summer of 18, as you'll recall, the salt dome that's shown on this map was going to fall down. It had reached its 80-year lifespan. Uh, I think it was stood up to be about a 30-year lifespan. Um, and for safety, uh, the county needed to act quickly so that the, the dome was ready, the new dome was ready for uh, winter operations. Um, Bumpy is the euphemism I'm using. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of public input. A lot of trees were cut down. Paradise was paved over, and the new uh, big facility was, was put up. Um, that presented a problem. The board has acknowledged that. And to the board's credit, they turned right around and stood up this task force. Um, next slide, please. The charge, just to remind everybody, uh, had five components to it. The first was winter storm response services. I'm not going to read everything there. Uh, there was some nervousness. You'll see up to 30 snow plows queuing. That caused some strife at the beginning. You all discussed that during your discussion of this charge, and we, we certainly attacked that with the task force. Next was the mulch, mulch distribution and leaf storage. So the mulch site is what I'll call it from here on out. Um, that's a very popular site. I live half a mile from there, and I see people there every single day. Leaf storage, I'll just call the leaf pile. That's, it's a pile right now of, of a lot of leaves. The Donaldson Run space on the trailhead, you'll recall um, the first slide we had up there. That's the trailhead that's next to the park that's next to the leaf pile. You all basically said that's, that's an untouchable site, and our group certainly acknowledged that and honored that. Park and open space I referred to before. And then considerations for other potential use, uses. Uh, Mr. Gutschall in particular was critical in getting that in there, and we have certainly addressed that as I go through this. I think that will become more clear. Uh, what's not in the charge, uh, you all did not direct us to consider cost, but we thought it would be irresponsible if we presented you a product and did not associate costs with that. So scrolling up to page one of the charge here, um, this is who you put on it. The only reason I show this is for equity purposes. There is no group up there that has more than one member. The at-large one, um, still, there's no group up there. Everybody had an equal voice on this. And for anyone to suggest otherwise, simply maybe they weren't paying attention or didn't read the charge, we think the groups you put up, up, up there, not only talented people, but great organizations that really had a big part in this. Um, as we go through this, I think everyone in the room and those watching at home um, should note that what the county was trying to do is improve service to residents and improve efficiency. Our group stipulated in the report that this is, in fact, the responsibility of local government, and you're to be commended for it. Um, I think we had some challenges with how the county wanted to go about. But at the core of this, the county wants to do this to improve service to residents. That's what this is all about, and I don't want anyone to lose sight of that. Um, at the end of this, we'll get to some recommendations outside of the charge. Our process was largely built on the Station 8 task force. I happened to chair that, and we, there were four members from that group that were on this one as well. Um, it seemed to work pretty well, and in that one, we had recommendations outside of the charge. In this one, we thought it would be irresponsible to not mention some things uh, like that. 
I have a whole long list of thank yous from June to Matt to Chris to Michelle to Mike to Bethany to Greg to Shaney to Jessica, other Michelle, APS, our consultants Ed Foley and Brian Stevenson and Marymount for hosting. We couldn't have done our work without the very talented staff that you all have. Um, I imagine if somebody came in for six months and told me how to run constituent services in a congressional office, it would be very difficult. I know you all are told how to do your jobs every day. We basically for six months told the staff what they should do and how to do their jobs better. And I commend them for being patient with us. We did not always agree. There will be a lot of disagreements coming out of this, I have no doubt. But they are to be commended for doing this. They took time away from their families and their, their day jobs to, to support what we were doing, and I thank them for that. Next slide. This is from 1995. Our report was submitted in 2019. If you scroll down, as is happening now, these are the exact same things they were looking at back then. I think it's always a mistake for task forces and commissions to think they're the first ones to do things. Our group was not the first to take a look at this, right? So this has been going on for a while. It took the Salt Dome incident, I guess we'll call it, um, for the task force to stand up, but we should not think that people hadn't been thinking about this or dedicating time to this before. Our methodology real quickly, um, so we can go to the general slide, please. Uh, let me go through this fairly quickly here. Our methodology was a three-pronged stool. This was not an us versus them exercise, and I worked as hard as I could, and I think our group did with their stakeholders to make that the case. Um, you won't see anything on the screen now. This is just me talking a little bit, but there were, it was a three-legged stool. We had the task force, we had the staff, and we had the public. And we made sure that nobody had a greater voice or less of a voice than anybody else. It was a very transparent process. Stool can't stand if it's got just two legs. And we really stuck to that, and I want to thank everybody in this room who was a part of that. Uh, we took our lumps. This task force took its lumps for sure. We were on the receiving end of a yard sign campaign. You know that people are paying attention in Arlington when there are yard signs. The last time that happened to me was during the school board days to move boundaries. Um, there were a couple seasoned volunteers, not on our task force, but from others, that had no problem expressing their opinions, thinking that our process was backwards. I don't have to tell this board or the county manager how difficult it is to navigate through that. Um, that, that was tough stuff, but uh, you know, we pressed through and, and off we went. Uh, the other part here is, is sort of the done deal perception. There was a perception that this is a done deal. There's 103 parking spots that are going to go on the site. Why are we even doing this? And thankfully, our group had the Fire Station 8 task force to refer to because the done deal there was the station was going to go at 26 and OD. And again, it didn't, and I think we're all, we're all proud of that. Our meetings, we had 11 of them. The second one, ironically enough, was snowed out. We had staff presentations, tours of the site, tours of the Trade Center. I did individual tours with each uh, task force member. Uh, we had public outreach to the groups. Um, we followed all sunshine laws. That was very important to us. There were never more than two of us meeting, um, and we were very aware of that. Our work would have been more efficient had there not been sunshine laws, but you all know about that. Next slide, please. Uh, page 12, yeah. So these are the groups. Again, I'm moving quickly through. Um, yeah, just page 12. Uh, that gray box, not so gray on this. Those are the groups that I reached out to individually. You'll see a wide swath of organizations there from APA to Missionhurst, spoke at all the civic association meetings up there, uh, Langston, JFAC, and Lee Highway Alliance. Anyone who could have had a part of this, school board members, we wanted to make sure they were included. Many of, some of them said thank you, be on your way. Missionhurst thanked us. I always think it's good to have a little God on your part when you're doing these things, so that was good. Um, and more, the, the civic associations were obviously very, very engaged in this. We had a community forum as well. It's not easy for everyone to get to a Thursday evening meeting at Marymount. This was based on Station 8 and what we did. So it was at the Central Library. We had 48 people attend. Staff had boards up, and then it was open mic night, um, which is good. It was good for people to, to express their opinions. We had two subcommittees. I want to th uh, thank Mike Hogan and Elizabeth Guerin. Uh, Elizabeth chaired the Parks sp slash Open Space Subcommittee and Mike the operational one. 
and then they would come, we would all come together at the end of our meetings to discuss what the other one said so that we were all on the same page. We, of course, had public comment at all of these. We had public comment at the end of our meetings, and then towards the end of our process, we had public comment at the beginning of our meetings. The Q&As were, of course, posted to the website. Front page slide, please. Uh, we wanted to have all the available information. So briefly going to go through what we received in order to make our, um, our recommendations. Um, so the JFAC one, the next tab, please. Uh, keep going back. No, the other way, the other way. Keep going the other way, all the way to the left. Thank you. This is the Eric Gutshaw Memorial slide, um, the JFAC slide. Um, <laughs> I went to two JFAC meetings, presented at one. Uh, we obviously had a JFAC member on the task force. That was a good move. We didn't just say no. We didn't just say maybe we should consider everything. JFAC went through a process. The X's there are obviously things we did not consider. APS said no way for a school, the fire station. We weren't going to have an 11th fire station up there. Uh, the instructional swing space, no. The other things we did consider, and we considered strongly. The consultants made um, renderings, shapes uh, of what these were, and we called that the what fits exercise, building on what JFAC did. Again, we weren't the first to do this stuff, so why not steal what everybody else had done that was already effective? That was an interesting operation that we did because if you put an operation center up there and white fleet parking, you run out of space on a 7.6 parcel really quickly, especially if you want a one acre park, don't want to encroach on the resource protected area and want to have a place for dogs to run around, right? Uh, have a salt facility, a leaf. So this became an exercise that became pretty self-evident. We couldn't do it all. And I know this was important to the board to consider everything. Some of these things simply didn't fit uh, space-wise. Some of these things simply didn't make sense uh, for proximity purposes. Next, please. Moving very quickly through this, this is the criteria we started to use as we considered our things. More information that we presented. Next slide, please. Marymount at our second presentation. Uh, Jamie's here, uh, the AD for Marymount. We appreciated her uh, participation. This was an initial rendering. It's not a surprise to anyone in here that Marymount University wanted an athletic field up there. It was an NCAA regulation size. Nobody should say soccer field. It was NCAA regulation size, sports field. There was concern from the jump. Again, I say this without pride or prejudice. This is not my opinion, but concern from the jump from the neighborhoods that this field would dominate the space. We will get more into this and dive deeper, but I, 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 the transparency of our group should be commended because anyone who wanted to present, presented. So this was first out of the box. Next slide, please. We then moved into what the county presentations were. So the county went through, um, and Mike and Greg and their team really did, um, you know, they, they presented some tough stuff as the chairman said, this is difficult stuff for non-experts to learn in a night. Uh, so we had the first one you could see, the second was the mulch. This is the leaf. Uh, yeah, so the mulch there, next slide please. Um, design criteria for the salt operations, if we could hold there. The thing that jumps out is right in the middle of the page, 100 parking spaces. That really caused a problem. The initial thought was they'd be on the site. This slide talks about how on and off to the county's credit, they engaged Missionhurst. And by the end of this, you'll see, we were able to bring that down significantly, almost to single digits. Next slide, please. Brine tanks, learned a lot about brine. This is the stuff that goes on the road, those streaks that you see, I'm wondering what they are. It's more environmentally friendly. It reduces the need for salt. To the community's credit, there was not resistance to brine tanks. To the task force's credit, it was how do we make these not so visible? How can we take advantage of topography? But everyone, I think, was in agreement that brine is a pretty good move. There are, you can use beet juice, I'm told, all this stuff. You know, environmentally conscious Arlington, this is a good move. It's something, it's never enough, right? But brine is a very good move. Uh, it's at the Trade Center, that's I think where that picture is, and um, our group, uh, it was news to us. We didn't know that going into the charge that brine tanks were gonna be a part. So then the footprint begins to reduce. The thing on the right is a V box spreader. Um, those go on the back of the trucks and that's important. I know, Mr. Schwartz, I'm sure that's what it's called. But um, 
those go on the back of the trucks and those will be more important when we get to the renderings. Next slide, please. This came as quite a surprise. This was a presentation that the county gave about the requirements that were included in the charge. Nobody had heard about a chain shop. So it said a change facility. Again, the county are the experts on this. We as lay people, this was news to us. When you throw a tire with a chain picture in the middle of a neighborhood, people start to get pretty nervous, understandably so. Uh, the county came back a couple of times, credit to Mike. This is tough stuff to understand. We got a better sense when we went to the Trade Center of what exactly this was. Again, these are in the county requirements. Next slide, please. A little bit more about what a change facility. Our group began to think, why don't we use that facility for community use, not just snow use for five events a year to include public restrooms at the park. So you'll see drawings here that reflect that. Next slide, please. This is just fire lanes and other requirements. And final slide. You can see there, not a lot of space to put all of these things and still have some open space or still have something that doesn't look like an industrial yard. So when we got to this point is when we started to encounter some trouble, as every public group does. It's not all smooth sailing. Uh, next tab, please. These are the things the county presented as its justification. I would urge the board to take a look at these next two slides because our recommendations pivoted around these two slides. This is not your small intestine. What these are here is if you look at the north zone B, I got my little pointer. This right here is the trade center. You see the trucks have to go up, do their snow work, and come back. It happens with all of the zones. Obviously, the North Arlington zones are what we're focused on for this particular task force. Back and forth, back and forth, do their work. That, on the surface, presents a tremendous inefficiency. And as I mentioned earlier, the county's goal is to improve efficiency. If we go to the next slide, please. What this shows here is real-time information. This is when we were meeting and it's hard to believe it's almost a year ago. You see the Trade Center right here, and you see where uh, consistent pattern of service requests, another way to say it perhaps is complaints. That's where they're coming from. To the right is Snowzilla. The question in front of the board that we'll get to in a little bit here is, yes, local government should certainly look to improve efficiency. That's what you're stood up to do, and our group stipulated that. But the question for the board is at what cost, all right? And we'll pivot soon here to what we're calling the if-then scenario. If you believe that this slide and the previous slide justify some of the cost you're gonna see or the disruption to the land that you're gonna see, then go for it. If you don't, our group strongly believed you can nibble around the edges a little bit, but to make major changes might not be in the county's interest. Again, that's your decision, that's, you know, that's not our decision. We gave you some recommendations and we will talk more about that as we go through here. So those two slides, th this slide and the previous one, are what the county showed us um, a lot for the justification. If I'm wrong about that, somebody can correct me, but I know our task force would agree because as you, I'm sure you've gone through all the Q and A's on our website, but there were a number of times when our task force members said, You've only shown us, and these three decks were referred to, um, that, was, that was a little tough for the task force to sort of put two and two together to say, I'm not sure four is where we're going with this. Um, next slide, please. Uh, yes, as we go through this, it's important to remember, these are the, this is the input we're getting. We weren't getting input from 2002, but this gives you a sense of Groups have looked at this, particularly the Old Dominion Citizens Association and the Donaldson Run Civic Association. If you look on the left there, those two civic associations took time to really nail down what they wanted to see as we went through with parks. We spend a lot of time looking at the operational side of this. I would urge the board to, to consider the charge which had parks as a major part of this. Very easy to get swept away with the operational exciting salt trucks and whatever. But the park thing to our group was just as important. Next slide, please. 
I will briefly go through our findings right now. Again, this is a process. I'm sorry to be talking so long, but I think trying to summarize six months in this time, um, this is important stuff. This language comes directly from our task force members. I will not read all of these, but I will read the ones that apply the most in the limited amount of time. First three, credible data justifying a need to enhance winter storm response operations at this location does not exist. More data is required for the county board to move forward with significant enhancements. The underlying cause of the revised op operational requirements remains uncompelling. As we cont continue to go down here, complaints about snow removal from past years seem to come mostly from addresses on narrow streets requiring small, often contracted trucks for plowing. Um, that's important because the changes at 26 and OD have the big trucks. Now, certainly little trucks would be up there, smaller trucks, but um, that's an important point. Next is the county should explore how it provides services, not just for winter storm operations, but the collection of leaves. I will touch more on that on a recommendation outside of the charge. Moving forward on these, the county operations voice is often louder than that of parks. And that's why I said we should all not just focus on the operations, but give equal time to the parks piece. Another one, in Arlington, we cannot afford to assume that what is already public space has no value in the context of project budgeting or location of functions or functional requirements. Regardless of current use or ownership, there's no free land resource in Arlington. Just because the county owns it doesn't mean it's free land. The importance of trees to our urban community is significant. And then the final piece of this one, which is equally as important, a bright professional dedicated and earnest group of people work for the Department of Environmental Services and the Department of Planning, Community Planning, Housing and Development. So those are what we found. That's basically, okay, let's collect all the data that we've seen and what did it mean to us? So now we get into, um, okay, uh, yeah, next slide please. Now we get into the refined concepts and this is, I'm sure what you've all been waiting for. This will start to show pictures. So what we had here is, um, can you go up the slide, uh, the um, 12th, uh, page 12 of it? Sorry, all the way up to page 12. Thank you. This is what we started with. Some terminology, just so we're all on the same page. Single access means there's one way in, one way out. Uh, loop means you can circle around. No, it means loop. Double access loop means you can go, you can ingress and egress out of two places. And then at grade means we're not going underground with any of these. We had some learning to do. By we, I mean I. I know you all have heard these terms before, but um, for the millions of people watching at home, that's what that means. Okay, loop to loop, right. We got a little loopy during this. So. If we could go down now to uh, slide, yeah, okay. So we came up with the, the consultants, uh, took our information and turned around in record time, you got your money's worth out of them, I think, um, what our thinking was. So you can see we started big and then we consolidated. Next slide, please, down to 22, please. And here's where we went, next slide. What you see here is a ground level of a concept. So this is the one with the field. You would come in, on, this is Old Dominion, come in Old Dominion, you also have to go out Old Dominion. This is the salt facility, these are the V-Box spreaders. This is parking for the big trucks and maybe some little ones. This is the change facility in pink. This is, well, so you see that, next slide please. We put a field on top of it. That is pretty complicated. What we have here is now the leaf pit. So the leaves were eh, somewhere over here. The trail is right here. You can see that this directly abuts the trail. This is a full-size NCAA field. So this would be turf. Not sure if that counts towards a park. Perhaps it could. This is green space here. Next slide, please. To me, the most striking thing, this is a 35-foot wall. This is the trail. You're starting to see the operational complexity of this. This is all underground. These are the trucks. This is top level. That's the leaf pit. This is the salt facility. This is the change facility. 
And as we move down here, again, I'm reflecting what our group voted 12 to 2, not my opinions here. These are the estimates we got. So it's the highest complexity if, we, if you were to do it this way. You can see the price tag is pretty high here. It disturbs 81% of the site. There is some encroachment perhaps on the resource protected area. Our group did not like this option and it was ultimately voted off the island. I will say that there was some disagreement between the consultant slash staff and Marymount University. Marymount at the late stages presented a rendering, a revised rendering of the field with the operations, which is in the report. Um, so that is in there, but this one, our group uh, did not particularly like. Next one, please. This is concept D. Again, this is the underground one. This is in and out, double ingress, egress. <clears throat> you see here that we have the salt facility there, a big box. You have leaves. Well, the leaves aren't underground. What the leaves are is these are walls. So if you think about the old salt facility, you could pile salt really high because there were walls. If you think about the current temporary facility, you can't pile it so high because there are no walls that could sustain that, so it's a larger footprint. These are the V-Box spreaders right here, right here. This is the change facility. Um, we could have, this is the rest, these are the restrooms which would be above ground for public use. This is a small room, important to note, maybe eight people sitting around a table. It couldn't hold a, hold a civic association meeting, but it could hold some sort of function. And then you see the park elements here. Please keep the park elements in mind. Park element here, mulch would be here. Right now the mulch is here, that's here. Our group considered that and ultimately went forward with something like this. Next one, please. What you see is now the top level. So we've recaptured green space. This depicts either a court or a field. It could be a turf field, could be a, we said pickleball a lot during our thing, so I'm gonna say pickleball here. Um, again, we have the parks here. Uh, you have some park elements with gazebos. So if we could go to the previous slide, and now the, la the next slide again, you see the difference. You're decking this. Next slide, please. 30 to fill it $40 million price tag. I imagine the lawyers were all over this because there's footnotes all over the place, but this one, again, disturbs the land, but you're gaining, we would gain back a top level there. That's a pretty high price tag. Uh, impact on existing trees, high very high. Um, the park element is there, it would be well over um, an acre. And the acre's the minimum, none of us were going for just an acre. Um, then the next two we had were variations of the same one. So this is E at grade. Important to note, the next slide doesn't show anything above ground. Nope, next, I'm sorry, previous slide. This is all one level, okay? So once again, the problem our group had was this is a lot of pavement. This is green space right now. The temporary dome is right here. This is paved right now, although the soil is not ideal. There was a soil study done, but um, you've had you know, 60 years of a salt facility right there. This is the change facility. This is the uh, rest area, the restroom. This is the salt facility. These are the V-Box spreaders. This is the uh, leaf area, and you have the double access again, park elements here, park elements here. Uh, and this is, if memory serves correctly, this is mulch. Next slide, please. Next one. This is a variation. What you have here is the leaf basically in the same place, and you have the salt here. So the leaf changes, the leaf pit changes a bit, and the salt dome changes where, where it's located. Um, keeping this, our group, other than the field option, our group had, and we didn't have interest in that, the group had no interest in disturbing this. In fact, the group had strong interest in enhancing that, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Those are the scenarios um, that I know we're gonna dive into here as I wrap up. Um, next tab, please. I'm happy to go through the scenarios with you, which I know we'll do, but let me just wrap with the last one, please. 
That's okay. That's less. Here, here's where our group landed on this. Our group landed with the um, the option D that you saw. So it's up here right now. This is the bottom level of it. Okay. Uh, we we outline in the report what this has. <laughs> here are some of the things that are different from the previous one to this one. Is basically parking. I'm happy to get into how much parking. At the end of the day, we were able to get below 20 parking spaces on the entire site. That's pretty good work, because we started at 103. That's the point of these task forces. There are a number of, of other elements where we were able to nibble around the edges. You see at the top here, uh, lay away, lay, lay by spaces, yes. Uh, you know, some of these are VDOT roads, and I know how fun it is to work with VDOT, so uh, there would be some collaboration that would happen there. Next slide, please. We'd also have some parking over here. Again, this assumes that Missionhurst would want to play ball. Um, we were able to gain back some land here. In the previous iteration, it chopped off here, so making this area a bit bigger, not touching the trail at all. Um, next slide, please. And this is the final thing that you see. The mulch would be here, so you would pull in, do your mulch collection, go out. This is the top level covered, obviously. Trees, could be a field, could be a pickleball thing. You've got the parking here for queuing and things like that, uh, which presents some challenges, of course. Um, and then redoing the 25th Street sidewalk so that there would be some continuity so people could walk the entire space. A um, little tricky to walk you know, through this stuff here, but nothing's ideal. Again, this leaf scenario would have the walls, and I would remind the board that this is 30 to $40 million. I can go on and on but this is probably a pretty good place to stop to take questions. Thank you. Well done, Mr. Simon and colleagues. Just as a reminder, we're not here to pick option A, B, C, D, or anything of, of that matter. That is not the uh, decision point. It's really for us to fully oh, understand. Mr. Chairman. Oh, all the work I'm sorry. Done. Can I do the recommendations outside of the charge? Oh, sure. Yeah. Why oh, don't we do that? Me. I'm yeah. sorry. No, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. That was an important part. I apologize. Um, our group had recommendations outside of the charge. Again, we thought it would be responsible to bring to the board's attention some, th some things that we found uh, that you may want to consider. Um, the first one was land acquisition. Obviously, continue the land acquisition piece. If you look at 26 and OD, um, and you look at if we were able to acquire some parcels of land attached to it, that site becomes a lot larger, a lot quicker. We were not about to recommend what those should be. Those are people's homes. That wouldn't have been responsible for us. But we know the board will continue to do this because this site is made up of about six different parcels of land over 30 years. So we would urge you to continue that. The next is to evaluate relocating the leaf storage. Does it have to be there and take up an acre, 1.2 acres of land? Um, does the county need to vacuum leaves at all? We go extensively into this and give examples. I, I, in the interest of time, I'm not going to get into all of them here. I'm happy to talk about what those look like. The timing to think about that right now is good because everyone's getting their leaves vacuumed up. There are other jurisdictions that don't do that and seem to operate just fine. There are some that, that contract those out. Our group urges the board to take a look at how leaf collection is done in the county. It is not a criticism of how it's done now of the people who are doing it. It's just maybe there's a more efficient, environmentally friendly way to do that. Evaluate reducing salt dependency and use. Not individual salt, but salt on the road. Um, there are a number of jurisdictions across the country who are leading the way, so I'm not too far from here. Brian is a great start, but how do we reduce the amount of salt? Because that ultimately ends up in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, we go extensively into here, and there are a number of studies cited in YouTube videos that I would urge the board to take a look at in all of your free time. Um, and then uh, we did have a recommended next step um, matrix. I won't go through all of that. What I will highlight, though, for you all is 
there's some low hanging fruit that we would urge you to take a look at now. If you look at the park that's, next, that's adjacent to the trail that's along 26th Street, that park right now is used, you know, Marymount students use that, that's wonderful. A lot more can happen with that park. We're not suggesting you put a huge play structure and all of that. That's stuff that you can look to do pretty immediately and separate and apart because the scenario that our group recommended 12 to two really only enhances that. There are no operational requirements that would be put over there. Mr. Chairman, I apologize and thanks for that extra time. Thank you, Mr. Simon, excellent. Useful areas for us to discuss. So colleagues, time for, uh, for questions and comments. Ms. Garvey. Yeah, question, because I don't think I heard you say it. Um, how did you get from over 100 parking spaces to only needing 23? That's a great question. It was just uh, good volunteer work, I'd like to think, but it was really more um, the county engaged Missionhurst. And I don't want to step too far out of line, but I'm just repeating what was said in our public minutes um, that are reflected in our public minutes that um, perhaps Missionhurst, there was a willingness in their large parking lot, which as you know is adjacent. Um, some of it also was reduced trucks up at this site. So initially the idea of queuing 30 trucks, by the end of our process, I didn't hear that they were looking to, the county was looking to queue 30 trucks. So reducing the actual number of snow plowing vehicles that go there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those were two of the big, big factors. Mm -hmm. And then putting some of them off site. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. And I know Mission Hurst, I think even now is very supportive. And when we're in the middle of a snowstorm, they're very supportive of our guys up there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I'll just uh, ask about the findings and the uh, more and credible data. Can you speak a little bit more on um, how we, we, just explain a little bit more about what that means and why what was presented wasn't compelling. That would be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And then what we did in, our, um, in the matrix at the end, the implementation matrix is we had an action, a responsibility, and a timing. Um, we want to try to make it easier for you. Uh, so the item first was data requests. So the action is request specific data from staff about the frequency of snow related events involving the north side facility, the cost benefit of the proposed changes in the service delivery, and the associated specific information about service requests and our resident complaints. So a larger data collection. Uh, we think that DES I don't think they were keeping any information from us. That's not what this was. Mm -hmm. But if that information exists, the board should really examine it. So it gets into data collection. And then the data review and analysis. So analyze the data and decide whether to move forward to expand the winter operations on the site. Even if the county provides justification for enhanced snow operations at the site, it should consider more targeted solutions to the problem before it moves ahead with major changes. If the board determines the consensus recommendation is too costly or not needed, the county, we believe, should discontinue its efforts to expand. That was our way of saying, if the data is not there, you probably shouldn't do it. If you find that the data is there, but you don't like the solution we gave you, we don't think that's a good idea either. The default mm -hmm. then is really to, now in the last month, I've driven by that site and uh, my therapist has told me not to, but I keep doing it. <laughs> And I have seen that there have been some, I'll just say enhancements to the site. I mean, mm -hmm. the county is, you know, you repave, the apron has been changed, the V-Box spreaders have arrived in anticipation. So it's not don't do anything, that, would be, that wouldn't be responsible. We just firmly believe that there needs to be a little bit more data than just those couple of slides that we saw. Okay, see if I have any follow-ups to that. Ms. Crystal? This is actually my same line of questioning. Um, this is so interesting, right? This is a very data-driven community, but I, I think it's worth kind of really exploring what, what is meant by data here. Yeah. Um, so I, I wondered actually, let me see if we could start with this and then I may have some follow-ups. Could you give me a couple of for instances? Um, because I'm, I'm seeing, for example, there's sort of a conflation of objective data and then uh, with subjective, right? How many complaints the county's gotten um, and so forth. So so what were you, I know we've seen things, for example, like response times or right. lag and turnaround. What were some examples of, of data points that you all wanted but felt like you couldn't get that were more in the objective category rather than the subjective about complaints? Well, 
I have to say, we not being experts in snow operations, we relied on the staff initially to give us what we should be seeing, right? I mean, typically with a group in Arlington, if the problem is the flood, there's 40 NOAAs in the audience. There's an expert for everything. With snow operations, there wasn't really. This is a little bit different and outside of perhaps, you know, planning commission or architecture. So we relied on the staff and it was, and I want to be respectful. This is not a criticism of the staff, but it sort of, it, it fell flat when we saw those two pieces of data and we continued to ask for data. Now, having been a part of several of these task forces, data is always what drives us. It was, it's what drove station eight. It's what drives most of these things, give us data. And I'm not sure we really received it. We requested things like um, give us, uh, you know, incidents for the past, I'm trying to think, 10 years for every snow with complaints. And I, forgive me if we did receive it, I'm not sure we received and if we did, it wasn't, it wasn't very compelling. So okay. our group sort of bounced that off of the idea of how much parkland do you wanna pave over? So we kept going back to that. The at grade scenario, would have been fine if this was a bigger site and you didn't have to pave so yeah. much, right? Like, it's reduced, it, it probably would have gotten, I shouldn't say fine, but it probably would have gotten more consideration. But if you're gonna pave over two thirds of the site, that wasn't gonna fly. So in terms of data, honestly, Ms. Crystal, we, we didn't really, I would think, I can't see the group behind me, but I think they would agree that some of the data that we perhaps had asked for didn't come our way. Okay, so so I think I heard a couple of objective things in there. Snow incidents, magnitude yeah. of snowstorms. Yeah, I mean, you know, snow incidents. The county, as you know, characterizes these in different ways. Yeah. Um, so Snowzilla is way over here, and then the, the duration that we had during January of 19 during our process is another way to categorize it. I think what our group ultimately wanted to get at, and perhaps you are, is how many days a year are we gonna use this site? Okay. How much do you wanna tear it up? Got it. So if we have five inc incidents a year, incidents a year, now that's five times that you have to put a plow on the ground. It's not, and the county does way more than that when they prepare for storms, but how many times are you gonna activate this? And I think one of the questions is how many times was 26 and OD activated in the past decade? We may have gotten that and I'm just forgetting. That's a really good one for the board to ask. Okay. I think what our group said during our discussions and certainly to me in private discussions was, if it's five times a year and we have global warming, do you wanna tear this whole site up for five times a year? Now you all need to balance that against that small intestine chart of right. trucks going back. Cause when trucks go back and forth, chains on the tires break, windshield wipers need to be replaced. Emissions. Emissions, things These like that. These are the heaviest duty vehicles that are, you know, least likely to be convertible to renewable sources. And I, mean, I think that's where I wanted to go next, if I could, for a little bit. Um, was there that discussion on the task force about really expanding the scope of data that we looked at to determine efficacy and and you know, necessity? I mean, I get on one hand, how many times have we activated it? Is there a cost benefit there? But did we sort of? calculate or have a request or a desire to talk about the externalities of, you know, shifting the risk to other places and, and, and all of that, or was it just more, let's justify the need for this particular site? Well, I tried really hard to keep us within the charge, mm -hmm. and that's difficult because we could have wandered all over the place. Um, so really, what are we gonna do with this site? I mean, we very easily, there were suggestions about putting the mulch site other places. Those are really good suggestions. I just knew in the limited time we had. Um, I will give two of our members credit, Elisa Cowan and Kit Norlin. They constantly reminded us of global warming. That's not something I certainly hadn't thought of going into this, but that's a consideration that this forward-looking board, you do 40-year 40 40 sector plans. What does that look like? So taking data, and we, I think we did request, I don't know who I'm looking, I don't have a staff, but um, <laughs> I, think we, I think we did, <laughs> um, I think we did. You've got a task force, Mr. Simon. Right, yeah. they're so tired of me. Yeah. Um, we did request, uh, I lost my train of thought, um, data that had to do, deal with, yeah, with degrees and things like that, I think or maybe we were thinking about it, but those are the types of things because in reality, 
you'd break ground in what, six years, something like that? Another six years of a quarter of a degree going up in the world, God forbid, but let's be honest, how many of these are you going to have? Now, the flip side of that is our weather becomes more intense, yeah, right? Yeah, I guess that's... Honestly, our group didn't have expertise in that, and I know it. somebody in the county will. Yeah, you know, I'll just that's say... That's a good one to ask, yeah. I mean, hurricanes are stronger. Are snowstorms stronger? I don't know. Are the frequencies more? We had six months to do this. You guys have four years at, at a clip to do this, so that's a question I would ask, those larger things, because Elisa and Kit were asking that throughout. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say, and I'll turn it back to Ms. Crystal, but, you know, the, the warming of the planet and its impact on climate change and the volatility of the weather that we, are, we experience, there is no direct yeah. correlation that warming of the planet will lead to decreased use here. Plenty of people can make a credible argument that resilience requires that you make yourself even more prepared for volatile and intense yeah. weather events. So. And I think our group then would respond, Mr. Chairman, then that's, you know, it's sort of getting into like the 1% doctrine. Are you preparing for the 1% Snowzilla? You know, we gave you a price tag sure. of 30 to $40 million, which in my mind is three-fifths of an elementary school. Right. And you all know the priorities much better than I. Um, our group sort of shook their heads and said, for what? Now, right. not everyone on our group. Sure. Um, there was a lot of, I'm summarizing, there yeah. was a lot of robust discussion, and the one at grade, the at grade scenario, it, that one certainly got more play than did, um, I mean, we spent more time on the field discussion, but I think the consideration from the larger group, more at grade, there was more of a discussion, and I had more members tell me, let's not kick this one off too quickly. Important to note, I didn't vote. It was a 14-person committee voting, not me. But thank you for allowing me to interject there. No, I appreciate it. It was exactly the line of questioning towards which I'm headed. And um, Mr. Simon, I really appreciate the sort of specificity about the types of questions mm -hmm. you'd like us to ask. I suppose, I don't know that I have more questions, but, but just to um, share a couple of thoughts or analysis here, in many ways to me, this is evocative of the conversation we're having about flooding, um, which I know these neighborhoods have also been impacted by. Um, and the question becomes, uh, in, a, in an era of global warming, as our weather gets... Um, more severe than anything we've experienced, right? And the 100-year the flood is now uh, biannual occurrence, right? Um, I think the, we've similarly been having conversations about what is the appropriate level of investment and expectation. So um, I, I think that's what you've given us here. The, the challenge and the, sort of the observation I chair, I remember shortly after I joined the board in 2016, we had that Snowzilla storm. Mm -hmm. um, and as uh, staff conducted the kind of after action, among the things that you all did was, was poll residents about what they expected to be um, a, uh, uh, the amount of time that they thought was reasonable for the county to clear what was, what, it was two feet of snow, four feet? What was Snowzilla? Oh, two, not four, two. 27 to 28 inches, so a little, two and a half feet. We asked residents what they thought a normal amount of time was for the county to clear that amount of snow, and the answer was less than 24 hours. And so I think, um, you know, it is certainly clear that people who are so, um, uh, so faced with the opportunity cost of that kind of operation um, would, would maybe have a different point of view about what, what it is reasonable to expect the county to do. Uh, we weigh that on the one hand, on the other, the, 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 the preference of residents um, who, who may not have um, uh, such an acute attachment to the opportunity cost of this site, but do have very high expectations. Um, uh, none of which is, uh, leads us to easy answers or leads me to easy answers. But I share that to say, I am very interested to the extent we can get at that objective data rather than the subjective. I think trying to um, find complaint-driven data, for example, um, maybe gives us some insight into that picture, but ultimately we'll have to make our best judgment call. Yeah, if I could build on the flooding piece, because I can hear some of the members telepathically saying, mention it. Yeah. Flooding came up, and if, if, you know, if you remember where this is, it's near, obviously, Donaldson Run. Yeah. Donald, actually, yeah. Donaldson Run, not the... Um, it's, there's an RPA right there. The, it's at one of the highest points in the county. That's why the water tower's not too far away from this. What does it look like if you remove a lot of these trees, um, if you take up a lot of that soil with flooding? Uh, that's something that our group certainly considered. And then sort of the second piece of that was what we wanted to give you was all of the available information for you to make sound and reasonable decisions based on all the available information. That's what you as policymakers should expect as a minimum. Um, there's more data out there, and we would urge you to get that. 
Thank you. Ms. Garvey. Yeah, thank you. Back on the complaints. I know it seems my, my neighborhood never complains. I was sort of interested on that on the map. If you notice my neighborhood, Fairlington, there were no complaints. I, I don't know. Um, question, though, what I did notice that you said that um, most of the complaints seem to come from, from people on streets where you couldn't take a big truck, you could only take smaller tr vehicles. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? I mean, how, do you really have the yeah. data on that? I think building on what Mike said um, a lot of the times, you know, just sort of the common sense piece of this would be it's, tar it's harder to plow out cul-de-sacs at, at the end of a street and things like that. So we, we heard some scenarios where that was certainly the case, um, which, which requires a smaller truck. So the idea of perhaps relooking at the service delivery, I do want to be careful. We are not experts in snow removal, um, and I do not want to step too far in front of the staff who are experts in this and do this for a living. Um, we would ask the board to take a look at that um, and dig deeper on the data. Keep in mind, we had 11 meetings. Six months seems like a long time. All of you came from commissions and things like that and boards, so you know how quickly these go. And you lose, pe unlike the county board meetings, <laughs> we lost people after about two and a half hours. Um, so we got, we would have to blow through these things, and we couldn't dig too deep. All no, thank you. I was just wondering what you did, and I don't take it badly. I wouldn't take what you said as yeah. expert gospel. Anyway, I was just kind of curious what information you, you had at this Look point. Look at smaller so. trucks. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Mr. DeFerranti. Uh, just a quick thank you to you and, the, and everyone who uh, got the glory of going two and a half hours uh, up to 11 times. <laughs> um, I, I, I want to just see if I understand your perspective on... The, the parking spaces, it's 20 is a firm number, is that, um, and I know we can ask staff, but is that, and you said most of the, the trucks, there was a reduction in trucks, trucks up at the site. When I glanced through again, I just, anything you can say to specify sort of what you thought on that and whether yeah, below 20 is possible. It's, it's definitely, I can see Greg getting a little nervous back there. It's more than 20. Um, let me uh, go through. Um, what the recommended one that we had. Okay. Double access drive through, ingress, egress from both roads, rooftop on deck parking space at the uh, park space at the southern end. Okay. New consolidated leaf storage, expanded nar natural park area around the trailhead, uh, park area at the south end along Old Dominion, so where the old salt dome was. New shift change facility feature, so that's a one bay garage that we saw for parking spaces, provides 13, park, uh, provides 13 spaces for on-site snow response truck parking with eight lay-by spaces created on the adjacent streets. That's the piece we talked about with VDOT. Um, so you can do the math there. Uh, and then the others would be Missionhurst. Yep. Right? Just, just the truck parking. Sure. And then any other, just to be thorough, and this last question, is there any other context that you might have from the deliberations that's not captured in the document? Because we can go to DES. If there's not, that's fine. Yeah, I think, I'm sure DES is taking notes and correcting the things that I said um, for some of these things. So they can give you more specifics for sure. This is, um, this is what we put in our report. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Gutschall, you're good. Thank All right. You. Thank you, Mr. Simon, for your yeah. the, all the task force meetings. Well, great. I think, um, you know, as we have had this uh, report for a number of months, so I know that we've all read it and considered the options, and moving forward as we consider this site, there will be a, a lot of other uh, considerations in play, and, and we'll have to look at it within the context of um, new understandings of operational uh, issues, upcoming budgets, et cetera. So tonight we're not here to endorse or recommend any specific path, but just to fully understand it. I'm glad to see the colleagues do. Ms. Yeah, Garvey? No, I did just say thank you. And I actually just had a quick question sure. for staff. We have a temporary salt dome there. How long will that last now? Just a question for my. Uh, I can be corrected on this. I think that the when we built it, the lifespan, it will last at least 10 years. Um, I think that's a. A so safe estimate. So we've got like eight to go or so.
Well, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I don't, I'm just saying, because you've given us a lot to think about, and I'm not saying we take eight years or anything, but it's good to know we have a little wiggle room to kind of think about this. I do. What I would urge the board to take a look at again, though, is is going back to the summer of 18. Mm -hmm. And eight, eight years seem a little bit longer than what I was hearing. Um, I don't want to correct the manager overtly here, but... Uh, just be mindful. Some things, perhaps, that were said might not align with that. Um, yeah, so let's let's be careful. I think the manager was addressing the lifespan yeah. of the building, not the plan for how long it's going yeah. to be in place. And you never so want to take be very it clear to the about edge. that. Just glad looking for a range for you all. I'm glad that that was was mentioned. If I may ask a question um, in limited time here. Yeah, absolutely. Because I know I'm going to get the question. In terms of a next step. Will the board, it's clear the board will go to staff for data. I think that's probably safe to say. Um, is this something that the board will be, like our park piece, the, the adjacent park there next mm -hmm. to the trail, that really it has something to do with it because it's in our report, but it's w very separate and apart from salt domes and leaf mm -hmm. piles. Mm -hmm. um, are things like that something the board might take up in a, in a closer look? Uh, quite, time frame. I mean, quite possibly. I don't think we're at a point tonight to say, yes, absolutely, we have to consider it, but certainly that is That's great. reasonable. All right. Yep. Thanks for all you do. Well, no, Mr. Thank Chair, you. can I just clarify something? Mr. Gutschall, sure. Because my understanding is that we've now accepted this report, and the manager could, in, his, in the forthcoming CIP cycle next year, could bring forward some recommendations because that's a 10 year CIP sure. and getting to what was the expectation that was set with the community. So I would expect that this is gonna come up one way or the other in the next CIP cycle. Do I, have that? Do I understand that correctly? Okay. Yeah, something relating to the site, sure, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I imagine there's smiles behind me, but that's great. Thank you for that clarification. Um, not real broad ones. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you all, we appreciate it. And uh, hopefully, Mr. Simon, we won't have to call on you again in the foreseeable oh, future. <laughs> so thanks again to all the staff and most importantly, the, ta the task force members for working through this work. At this point, we'll shift to our second work session, which is going to concern the Columbia Pike Retail Market Study. So we invite staff for that item to come up to the table. All right, for item number two, we have the Columbia Pike Commercial Market Study. Uh, so we'll first turn it over to Mr. Schwartz to yes. structure our conversation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And 
As many of you will recall back in fiscal year 2018, uh, which two years ago is part of the adopted budget, the board directed a, a funding allocation of $150,000 to Arlington Economic Development. And I'm going to read exactly what the guidance said. It was to, quote, produce a retail and market study conducted by an independent firm that interprets existing commercial conditions and challenges and opportunities for re revitalizing the Columbia Pike submarket. So the objective, as laid out there, was to get some clarity and try to get a sense of what future market conditions might be along Columbia Pike and get a solid understanding of how the market works. And so prior to going ahead and engaging a consultant, um, AED went out and had some discovery and outreach with the community and tried to get a sense of the commercial market. And then we brought on a consultant and uh, this process we've had so far is uh, not meant to be and shouldn't be confused with a visioning process, but instead what we did is an objective analysis of market conditions. So we're going to hear results today uh, from that study from our consultant, HRNA, and then we have a brief presentation we're going to make on key findings and recommendations about potential, and then we'll pivot on to a discussion about what the next steps should be. So with that, I think I turn it to Steve. Yes, Steve's, Stephen's going to go through and introduce himself and then make the presentation. Great. I don't think you're on, Stephen, are you? There we go. Uh, Stephen Riley, I, I work with HRNA Advisors. Um, as Mark said, we've been working um, closely with AED um, since really the beginning of this year to undertake a market study as it relates to um, commercial conditions along Columbia Pike. Um, focus on, on retail conditions, but also looking into other commercial uses and sort of implications um, that they have on, on the retail environment along the pike. Um, I have the, the fun challenge of distilling about 150 pages of analysis that we've put together uh, into a, a very brief summary for you all today. Um, so I'm going to spend uh, about 10 or 15 minutes just talking through some of um, the key findings as it relates to um, the conditions that we saw. Um, and then I, I believe Mark will, will take it away with um, sort of um, how AED is working to translate that in terms of uh, near-term um, items for exploration. Um, I guess, uh, right here. Um, so first, just want to uh, you know, preface uh, the market conditions that we'll run through um, with a framing of how we were undertaking the analysis that we did. Um, it's really part of broader ongoing initiatives that are in place in the county and recognizing you know, that those are underway. So as we're thinking about you know, how we promote vibrancy and, and commercial activity along the Columbia Pike Corridor, also recognizing you know, the um, initiatives in place to reinforce identity and a sense of place, um, improve transportation connectivity, and, and generally promote a walkable pedestrian scale environment. Um, Oh, sorry. Yep. I'll bring it closer. <laughs> yeah, let me know if you can't hear me. Um, I think, the, and some of the, I'm going to talk through um, some of the data that we came across. I think some of this may look familiar to you all, you know, as people that know and are familiar with Columbia Pike. Um, but a lot of this was about really understanding sort of the foundational information that informed um, the, the toolkit of recommendations that we ultimately developed. Um, and, and first, it's most important to, to start by um, you know, recognizing that, that retail along Columbia Pike is, is a market in, in transition. Um, you know, with uh, the, the form-based code being put in place in the mid-2000s and the development of a more urban typology um, along the street front, um, it's created a, a really sort of new type of, of commercial environment. Um, and it's, it's transitioning from this, you know, historic auto-oriented suburban corridor to a more walkable urban corridor. Um, when you look at retail that, that is in place on the Pike today, um, a little over a third of it is in new development that um, is in this sort of more walkable typology. Um, and about two thirds is in what we define as legacy space, which is um, you know, more traditional auto-oriented spaces. Um, and so what that tells us is that you know, this is still a market that is in, in transition from a commercial perspective. Um, and it's really following a similar trajectory to, to what we um, see in other locations. Uh, you know, there has been you know, a higher rate of store closures than what you would typically see in sort of a standard retail environment, um, but 
that really occurs in, in, in any location where you see this type of transition happening in, in the market really needing to sort of um, find its footing and, and you know, figure out its placement. Um, I also want to take a step back and, and just sort of frame the, the competitive landscape with which, uh, within which the Columbia Pike uh, commercial environment exists. Um, and noting specifically that there are you know, a number of retail or nodes that exist um, really directly surrounding or in close proximity to Columbia Pike, um, the three most notable of which are the Ros and Boston corridor, uh, the Route 1 corridor and Bailey's Crossroads, um, all of which offer more than 2 million square feet of, of retail space, um, and most of, uh, all of which also um, offer a wide range of uses, so going beyond the more neighborhood-focused uses that exist along Columbia Pike um, to destination goods where you're, you know, clothing, electronics, uh, uses along those lines. So uh, the main takeaway here just being that, you know, residents, workers have options when they're thinking about where they, where they shop and spend time. Um, as I just noted, the mix along Columbia Pike is primarily driven by neighborhood and convenience retail, so that those are uses like drug stores, hair salons, uh, dry cleaners, banks, grocery stores, sort of your day-to-day -day errands rather than what we would consider destination uses. And, and in the analysis that we've done, um, you know, the, the Pike is really positioned, best positioned to continue supporting these types of uses going forward. Um, one of the interesting findings that we found is that um, the market conditions for, for legacy spaces that exist along the corridor um, are very healthy and vacancy in those spaces is actually lower than what you see in the new development that, that exists along the Pike. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that, some of which tie to um, rents and uh, required rents. Um, some of it is, again, getting back to this idea of the market in transition um, and the fact that you know, if there's uh, one singular walkable building but the, the broader environment has not really um, sort of coalesced, um, you know, there's challenges in, in pedestrian foot traffic and things along those lines that generally support that type of retail. Um, and so overall, uh, vacancy is 5%, new development is 7%. These are all healthy retail numbers. You generally, anything below 10% is generally considered a healthy retail environment. Um, so it's not to say that conditions in the, in the new space are, are unhealthy, um, but legacy spaces are performing well. And as we're thinking about uh, new development occurring along the pike, making, you know, understanding the, the risk of sort of displacement of those tenants or um, you know, differences um, that those tenants may be looking for relative to new space. Um, we also conducted a, a retail gap analysis to understand how the supply of retail that exists today compares to um, the demand for retail space that can be supported. And what we found is you know, there's a little over 700,000 square feet of space that, that exists today. Uh, there's about 94,000 square feet of space that, are un that is under construction now. And a, an additional 45,000 square feet that could be supported today. Um, when we take into account uh, expected growth in both the, the resident and worker population through 2030. Uh, we expect that will support about an additional 51,000 square feet of space. So total supportable square space through 2030 is about 90, a little over 90,000 square feet. Um, that's excellent in terms of you know, recognizing that there is potential to support additional demand and um, you know, uh, build additional retail space um, along the corridor. Um, but it is worth caveating that um, that amount of new space can be met fairly easily through a couple of new projects. So for example, um, the, new, uh, the new Harris Teeter anchored development that is, is uh, going in, into uh, the Columbia Pike corridor um, is a total of a little over 80,000 square feet. So, you know, another one of those types of developments um, you know, would really, you know, essentially support the demand that we're projecting going forward. And, and just to reinforce that and, um, get at one of the ideas that our, our study started to explore. Um, you know, as you're thinking about retail development going forward and, and broader development, um, there is a potential to create an oversupply as you're thinking about new development. Um, when you look at the, the retail demand that's supported on upper floors by, by new mixed-use development um, and how that compares to the amount of retail space that's put in place uh, along you know, a ground floor environment, uh, particularly along the pike where there are, are uh, ground floor retail requirements in place, um, you know, what is on the upper floors is generally does not support the amount of retail space that's being put on the ground floor. And so while that uh, is okay today when, when there's additional space that can be supported, um, as we go into the future, um, 
and again, have a couple additional projects that come in place with planned retail development, um, there's potential for there to be an oversupply. Um, so wanting to make sure we're kind of recognizing that and thinking about the balance of retail going forward. Uh, I'm gonna spend uh, just a minute or two talking through the, the population groups that support uh, demand for retail along the pike. Uh, it's, it's largely residential um, and that residential, the demographics of that residential group are evolving. Um, one of the things we highlighted here is uh, change in household incomes, which are increasing much more quickly along, uh, in the areas along the pike relative to the metro area as a whole. And that's reflective of, of broader demographic changes at play. Um, you're starting to see some of that with, with changes of retail, but retail does tend to lag demographic changes um, just due to the nature of retail leases being longer um, and, and retailers sometimes being slow to respond to, to those changes initially. Um, the, there, there is a small office worker population along Columbia Pike, but it is really a, a not what is driving retail activity there today. If, if you compare Columbia Pike to the Route 1 corridor or Rosin Boston, um, there's a much lower number of office workers, and correspondingly, you know, um, they're less of a driver of, of retail demand activity. Um, we um, looked within our study both at you know, potential for additional office uses as well as additional hotel uses um, to try and diversify the mix of the retail tenant base and whether there was potential to support that. Um, what, we've saw is, or what we found is that there's really limited potential in the near term to be supporting those types of uses, um, primarily due to um, the locational considerations that those uses are looking for when they're deciding where they want to be. Um, and so we you know, get into some detail of that here. Um, don't need to, to go through each and every item, but happy to talk through that further if you all have questions. Um, and also, you know, it's not really possible to, to go through any discussion of retail without un, uh, you know, talking through the implications of e-commerce and, and what, what the sort of um, implications are for somewhere like Columbia Pike. Um, e-commerce now makes up about 10% of total retail sales and is projected to continue growing um, over the next few years. Um, and, and while that impacts retail nationally, um, we think Columbia Pike is, is relatively well positioned um, just given the nature of the types of retail tenants that exist there relative to those that are most impacted by uh, e-commerce. That is primarily you know, big box stores um, with consumer goods that are you know, more destination focused. Um, so you, you know, books, uh, clothing, things along those lines. Um, your day-to-day -day services um, and uh, sort of um, neighborhood goods are, are less impacted. Um, and, and that, again, like I said, really uh, positions Columbia Pike well and the types of tenants that would be locating there in the future. Uh, and then lastly, uh, I just wanna close out by sort of acknowledging that the fact that retail character is not uniform along Columbia Pike and um, we spent some time in our analysis looking specifically at different retail nodes, um, how that character was different um, and what the implications were going forward. Um, one of the key takeaways or implications we identified is, is really the idea of focusing new space that's built in the existing nodes and allowing that concentration of retail to really foster a, a dynamic retail environment um, and centers of activity that can um, evolve into, into their own you know, uh, types of character. Um, we classified that in, in three different ways, um, calling main street nodes, intersection-based nodes, and neighborhood nodes. Um, and really all of that is, is just to understand sort of the, the types of retail that are best positioned in these different locations um, and how you start to differentiate um, each of them based on their character. Um, so main street nodes really functioning as centers of activity for um, the whole corridor and providing you know, the widest range of retail um, store types. Um, and then working down to neighborhood nodes that are really focused on the immediate surrounding area and providing um, the most locally focused uh, goods. Um, I believe that is it. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Mark to talk through uh, you know, how uh, AED took that information and, and translated it into current actions. Actually, before we turn it over to Mark, why don't we see if there are any questions for Mr. Riley? Ms. Crystal? Yeah, um, thank you so much. It's been really interesting. Could you you helpfully put the um, uh, retail vacancy rate on the pike in context of what's considered healthy nationally? Hmm. Um, did you do any comparisons to other markets in Arlington about where that shakes out compared to 
um, a big retail corridor, like for example, the Clarendon area? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we do have that data and looked at it. We don't have it in the presentation here. Okay. Um, it, it was not fundamentally different in terms of uh, like understanding the health of the market. Okay, thank you. So quick data question. So as you, <clears throat> your slide six, which has the legacy at 2% vacancy, new at seven, but an overall of five, mm -hmm. given that it's two thirds legacy on the pike, that number should be closer to three. I think it's a, it's a product of, of rounding. Um, Got it. But um, it doesn't change the, the sort of fundamental dynamics of the market. I mean, three is different than five, so I would. Or, but uh, if it's like, uh, I think it's like 4.5, you know, round, we just rounded up to five for the purposes now. Well, it wouldn't be though, because most of the development is legacy. So it's not just simply an average of two and seven. It's weighting the two thirds of it that's legacy and that Correct. gets you closer to three. Correct. So we, I can pull the, the specific numbers for you if, if that's helpful. Um, it, it would be. I mean, if there's a reason for it, I'm happy to know it. I just, three is a different story than, than five, yep. so. Okay. Yeah, we, we, can, we, we can look at that and make sure it's a report, but it's, it's. Okay, all right. Any other, Ms. Garvey? Yeah, on the implication, just that same slide, um, to make sure that I understand, I think part of the issue, so legacy, they tend to be older stores, right? And not in maybe the best shape. So they're gonna need to get redeveloped, they're gonna get renovated, something's gonna happen, and then the costs will go up, right? So that's, and that's the whole displacement risk. So that um, legacy is, it, it, it's better and more secure in some ways, but just until they have to actually change and then it's actually less secure. Yeah, in, in, in addition to the point that you made, which is true, uh, there's also a question, not all the legacy businesses naturally wanna go in the, the space that is being created in your development. Um, so for example, if you primarily rely on um, auto traffic that's passing through a new development, um, either you know, doesn't have parking or the parking is not um, readily visible from the street, um, that you, know, you may be less interested in occupying that space relative to a different space that um, yeah. exists. And how many legacy tenants own, not, they're not tenants, they own their own property. How many legacy companies along the pike, do you know, own their own property as opposed to leasing it? So we didn't get into the specifics of, of ownership versus leasing within our analysis. Um, based, our, my impression is that it's, overwhelmingly uh, leased space. Space, um, right. But I, I don't know the specific yeah. numbers. Okay, thank you. All right, terrific. And um, my other question concerned the uh, income slide. Excuse me, I gotta switch screens to go back again. Thank you. So you have a slide here just about uh, income demographics in the pike compared to the DC area. And it's, it's just, I'm, I'd love to hear your thoughts about what's going on here and give us some broader regional context. I mean, one way to read this slide is to say that the pike is gentrifying. Another way is that the income growth on the pike has been actually healthy. It's just that the DC area is not experiencing good income growth. So just from a curiosity, how does this translate into the attractiveness of the pike as a magnet for retail investment, given that it's at least on an upward trajectory versus a flat. Yes. So, uh, you know, based on the analysis that, that we did, a lot of the, the demographic um, changes that we're seeing are a product of the new development that's taking place where there wasn't previously residential units. So, if you have a one story commercial strip. It's replaced with a six-story residential building. So it's really based on the increase in the units. And as you have new sort of class A apartments being built, um, you know, incomes and, and are higher and the demographics of, of those you know, different household types are attracted to uh, an apartment versus a single family home. Um, and so that's really where you see that, that change. Um, does that address? It does, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. McCauley. So the um, Mark sort of hinted this a little bit, but but the the, obje the objective of the work session, uh, obviously to present the findings, but really to further present uh, propose uh, strategic implementation um, next steps and receive party county board guidance on these on the related policy issues, and just to sort of 
iterate, just so we put this in context, the purpose of the study was to provide an objective analysis, and I think we got a lot of good information and a lot of good work um, uh, out of the study. And as part of the scope, there was also a, a sort of last piece, which we call the strategy implementation toolkit. And I think the important point is we always saw that the primary focus was the market study, and this was really HRNA sort of helping us start the discussion of given some opportunities and challenges identified in the market study, what could we think of? I think one thing we've, we've talked a lot about as we presented this publicly is it's a, it's a really broad-based set of potential tools, none of which the scope anticipated HRNA doing true cost-benefit analysis or putting them in the, in, the, in the county context. So what we really want to present today is some of the key takeaways we as staff got from the report and then what are some strategic implementation frameworks and even some recommendations to consider in terms of addressing some of those. So key market takeaway number one. Um, Stephen uh, referenced this, but to put it in a, in a, in a bit finer point, the, the commercial market along Columbia Pike operates primarily as a neighborhood serving, and that's not a good or bad thing. That's, that's typical of most commercial markets that sort of focus first on sort of the people that live around them. Um, and obviously a lot of the destination type shopping, there's a lot of competition uh, for that regionally and, and within Arlington. But even more so, as Stephen referenced, that the Columbia Pike is not a single commercial corridor. It really is a selection of nodes. And we often talk about corridors and then immediately start to realize that a long stretch of road like this, that the environments change from a market perspective pretty, pretty significantly as you move from different parts of the pike. And not just in terms of demographic and demand, but in terms of the purpose of those commercial clusters and who in the audience they're serving or the consumers they're serving. So when you think about these nodes as, as different, the, the strategic implementation response is that as we're thinking about branding, uh, marketing, and placemaking efforts, do we think about really having a greater focus on how we brand the individual nodes? And when we talk about that, we not only talk about the unique nature of those nodes, but also understanding who the consumer is for those nodes and how you talk to that, that, that audience. So an audience could be residents. It could be consumers who are visiting and shopping at, at retail. It could also be retailers slash brokers who are looking for space. And I think so one of the, and we'll obviously have more time. We're introduced to this, we'll have more time to talk about these. But the idea of spending a little more resources rather than just talking about the pike as a whole, of talking about the unique nodes and really catering a marketing message towards uh, particularly core audience groups. Key market takeaway number two. Uh, this, was, this was something that uh, Stephen referenced, obviously, of the transition from a primarily auto-oriented, single-use commercial environment to a more walkable, mixed-use environment. Uh, and the challenge that often has for early adopters, and I think one of the things that we always stress is this is not unique. This is not, Columbia Pike's not different than any other place that has tried this. In fact, for, for those that, that are listening that have been wrong, long enough, the RB card had a very similar experience where it transitioned uh, legacy spaces that had a certain market focus were transitioned over time. And the commercial market that we see today and many of our mature commercial nodes took a while to get going and often had a couple of hit, hit fits and starts and a couple of key anchors that moved in that progressed it. So Columbia Pike's not unique, but that during that transition period, the question is, does increase, is this the time when increased flexibility of use is important? The form-based code um, envisioning process lays out an ultimate vision, but to get to that vision, it's not from zero to, to 40 years, right? You have to go through that transition period. And so one of the things we want to talk to you about is whether increased use flexibility would allow for one, space to be filled, and two, which I think we're actually more excited about, does it allow Columbia Pike to position itself more uniquely in the regional context by allowing uses in the types of places that other parts of Arlington, they are not allowed, uh, where it may, may actually create a unique competitive advantage for the Pike as they go out there and market uh, those spaces. And key market takeaway number three, uh, this relates to uh, businesses and legacy spaces. We, we distinguish between legacy businesses and legacy and really business and legacy spaces because not all the businesses are legacy businesses in the, in the sense of have been around for 50 years. But it really is the spaces of the legacy of, of, a, of, of, of what the pike was relative to what the pike is envisioned for. And as Stephen said, that market is very strong. And, and the threat really hasn't been rents going up and those spaces are 
our turnover. In fact, I think those spaces are very stable and the landlords that own those spaces are very happy with not having to worry about turnover and not having to worry about releasing those spaces and having very strong tenants. Uh, but redevelopment is the threat. And so one of the strategic implementation responses we'd like to talk to you about today is how do we think about providing enhanced support for those businesses in those legacy spaces as we continue to move forward by of implementing the form-based code? So with that said, the way we've set up this presentation, um, and uh, Chairman Dorsey, if this is, if, this, if, this is uh, if you agree with this, is to take each one of these, stop, talk about them, uh, and then sort of move through each one of them. So Perfect. the first one, the branding market and placemaking efforts. Uh, the background and recommendation is one of the important things we've talked about sort of how do we look at enhanced branding and marketing is we remind everyone that when people look to county staff, we, we always say AED markets the county. We don't market neighborhoods. We market the county as a whole. We obviously provide information on our neighborhoods and love, love all our neighborhoods equally, but we don't have unique resources set to particular neighborhoods. So the organization that does obviously focus primarily uh, wholly on the pike is CPRO. And the question it really is, is, and the recommendation is, should we consider within the, uh, in a separate process, not today, but we want to get guidance of uh, the budget process of does this flow into a work plan discussion with CPRO about how they can maybe implement some of these ideas? So the questions for the board, and these are obviously just suggest suggested questions, you guys can come up with your own as well, um, is what is the value of an enhanced or refocused branding and marketing approach for identified commercial nodes along the Columbia Pike? What is the alignment with county manager recommendation that CPRO should continue to be the primary owner of any future efforts and any further guidance as we go into the FY21 work plan process with CPRO? Okay, so we'll land on that slide for a little bit to have that non-leading question on the table. <laughs> well, I did say there are recommendations. So. <laughs> and do want to acknowledge that we have John Snyder, the outgoing president, right, of Columbia Pike Revitalization Organization, better and more widely known as CPRO at the table for, uh, you know, if any questions need to be directed to him, he is certainly here, and I'm assuming ready to answer. All right, beautiful. Colleagues, any thoughts here, Mr. DeFerranti? I actually was going to let Ms. Crystal, uh, first, I'm for flexibility as a general rule. I mean, I feel like, and it's, uh, I appreciate also the e-commerce mention. I think all of us are aware of that. I, I guess this feels like a direction that I'm, um, that, that seems like the right way to go. Um, you know, I, I sort of was just, the non-leading question is what resonated with me. And so I was going to let Ms. Crystal go and then echo that point for a little humor. Sounds good. Ms. Crystal. Sure. So um, let me say this. I mean, this is by way of getting to my question. I think this is such a fascinating body of work and just really want to thank h and our HRNA, our staff, Mr. McCauley in particular, and CEPRO for being a partner in this. Um, I think one of the things we've talked about, and I remember giving this guidance, was that we all agreed there was a retail problem on the pike. But what was not clear was what that problem was. And I think if you asked different folks, you would have gotten different answers. There's a lack of upscale retail that I, whomever the I may be speaking, want to shop at. Or I'm concerned that a restaurant that I really liked that was new couldn't make a go of it. Or I'm concerned about a business that I love being threatened by redevelopment. And I think what is really fascinating about this is that it has helped us really narrow what the problem for the pike is. And so let me, I'll lay my cards on the table and say I'm actually most excited to talk about number three because I think that has been surfaced as what the problem is. Um, so that said, I do want to ask a question, and forgive me because this sounds a little pointed, um, and, and I don't mean this in, in any way to, to suggest that CPRO isn't a great partner, and I think whichever of these we decide to lean into, CPRO ought to be our partner. But what problem are we trying to solve with increased branding and marketing? And I noticed you, the phrase here was develop branding, but you sort of in the presentation talked about spending more resources, or this slide says enhanced, I think enhanced and or refocused. So for me, I could see being very supportive of refocus. We've learned some things about kind of the nodal identities that might make sense, the existing re resources that CPRO or the county has, um, that they, sh they could be best spent by surfacing or by celebrating those nodal identities. Um, but <coughs> if we're talking about uh, increased expenditure of resources um, to brand and market, uh, a, a market that actually has relatively low vacancy rates, um, uh, 
what are we trying to achieve, I guess? So I'll, let, me, let me phrase that question to anybody who might wanna, might wanna answer. What's the problem we'd be trying to solve with more branding? John, I'll obviously let you weigh in as well. But I, I think one of the things that I think we found, and I think we probably knew intuitively, but as always, when, until you sit down and sort of do the study and think about it, you don't always sort of doesn't become sort of crystal clear is, you know, the branding and marketing, I think CEPRO does a great job at branding and programming the pike. But the question is, to what audience? And I think the idea of how you speak to, when we talk to brokers, they have a very different need on how they want to be spoken to in terms of opportunity. When you talk to consumers and how you brand it, we, we made the, 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 the analogy of when someone says I'm going to 14th Street, they don't mean anywhere in 14th Street in DC, they mean a particular intersection. Mm. And Columbia Pike doesn't, when someone says I'm going to go to eat in the Pike, they probably have a sense, but it's not a universally known sense of where the sort of ground zero is for, for, for consumers. And then obviously the residents themselves, how are we using the, the market? But I think that's, and I hope this is answering the question, but that's kind of the enhanced or refocused of, do we need to spend a little more time and, and resources in whatever form that takes to think about how we speak to these different audiences and how we create unique brands of, of the different nodes so that it's clear when we're spending the resources, we're not trying to, I mean the challenge is if you spend resources but it's spread out too thin, you don't get the value of that versus spending yeah. sort of more dedicated sort of strategic resources trying to get trying to get some some very discernible outcomes. So that's really helpful. I will say to sort of start to answer these questions or to put a, a point of view on the table. I am very supportive of the idea of spending smarter and to the extent we have resources or funding CEPRO to do some of this branding and marketing. I think you've made a great case for why there should be identities in terms of a, an additional dollar. I'm not certain it goes here. And I obviously have some thoughts about where I think it should go instead. But because again, we're trying to get people to talk about a certain identity or, or um, brokers or, or tenants to think about a certain identity, but we're not trying to fill you know, broad swaths of vacant retail. Um, uh, so you know, the idea of embarking on a huge marketing campaign um, seems a little bit less clear of a problem to solve than some that were later surfaced in the presentation. Okay, Mr. Gutschall and Ms. Garvey. <laughs> I'm actually wondering uh, if I could ask Mr. Snyder to respond to yeah. to the question that's on the table. W would you like to adjust? Because to your comment just now, I was re reading back through the um, the last quarterly report that we had from CPRO, which outlines uh, their plan, essentially their work, their proposed work plan. And there's there's and maybe you could speak to this, John. There's a couple things in there I think that could be tied to this particular branding, marketing, placemaking. But I think the I'm, I I expect that what we're going to find, and this is what maybe you can confirm, is that across these three topic areas, they are doing multiple things that that sort of interlace with their work plan. Mm -hmm. It's not like there's these dollars specifically for branding and marketing. So maybe John, you'd like to address that. Yeah, is this on now? No, sounds like it's not. No, it's not. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, in, in answering that, um, the reason for the branding and marketing is to grow the market. Right now, we have been talking in terms of our placemaking, primarily within the Pike community. We're getting people out, uh, helping uh, identify as a community instead of just being a road. Um, that's been the first 30 years of CPRO, becoming that community. But it doesn't have the same strength of a market other places in the area. When you say, Going to the Pike, uh, most people in the area don't know what that means. Even when you say Columbia Pike, they might think we're talking about Columbia, Maryland. Um, other than really the Blues Festival, um, we don't have those things that are drawing people and identifying that this is the place to come. This is tied in very closely with keeping the businesses that come here because we've had a lot of turnover. Um, Thankfully, it's been relatively quick turnover, but we want when people make this investment to be able to stay. We were delighted years ago when P. Brennan's was one of the first to put their stake down and make a big investment in the pike. They closed several years ago. The space is empty. That doesn't help the businesses around them. And so what we want to be able to do is strengthen that so that we have more people coming to the pike to sustain these businesses. Uh, and at the same time, within the Pike community, uh, we have a lot of people who, when they're going to go uh, do something, they get in their car and they go to other markets that you see surround uh, the Pike area, whether it's going to Boston or going to Bailey's or to other areas uh, where they could be coming to the Pike for, for those same needs. 
And so it's, it's really to build on both of those elements. So could I ask a follow-up question of staff to that on that then? Sure. Thank you. But remember, they're looking for guidance from us too, so. Right, but I, I yes, um, fair point. But what I am curious of is given Mr. Snyder's answer just now and uh, the results of the findings of this study that the pike and the various nodes are best suited as neighborhood serving retail, is it the position then, uh, is the finding, the nuance of the finding that capturing more of the market that is in the neighborhood so, so that people, it's not about getting people to come from, you know, uh, outside of the Pike community to get people from North, North Arlington, you know, Lee Highway to come down to the Pike necessarily, but it is about making sure that people who are in proximity to the Pike, that they don't go elsewhere, they don't go out to Mosaic District to go do their, their night out. Yeah, and, and I think that was one of the primary takeaways when we talk about the pike being a neighborhood serving, that doesn't mean that you can't do a better job at people that live in that trade area going there. And then, as we always remind ourselves, Arlington's small, so you know you can identify yourself living in another neighborhood and be two miles away. Yeah. So I think the trade area for the pike could also be expanded, per John's point, not to include people that are choosing between Reston and, and downtown, but people that still live um, in, in close proximity. So. When we think about demand, one of the things that HRNA did a good job of is is putting together the demand numbers, but it always relies on what we call capture rate, right? What share of the market are you capturing? And I think most places like Columbia Pike that really are neighborhood serving, they win the battle on capture rate. They win it by, if you live in that neighborhood, it isn't just should I go there or do I go there once every couple of months, but do I go there every time because there are six great restaurants that I can, that I can mix up. So I think that is true, Mr. Gottschall, that I think it is about first capturing the market you, you have, uh, and then sort of continuing to, to blossom that. Ms. Garvey. Yeah, um, a lot, I, I really like the idea of the nodes and pointing out how different they are, and I find myself thinking, so when you have shopping malls, right, you have an anchor store, and then people come to the Sears, you know, the old fashioned way of doing it, and then they get to the stores. Do nodes function somewhat the same way as if you had a an anchor store, an anchor attraction in each node that that would help. So, for example, like Brenner's Pastry, I mean, I think a lot of people went there because they went to the pastry shop and then it went away. Um, is that the way it would function a little bit along the, along the pike? Yeah, so one of the things that's, that's, that's always different in urban environments than suburban or quasi-suburban environments is, is, uh, is landlords that build shopping malls do a lot of curating of their retail concept and they make explicit decisions of what retailers are next to each other. In urban environments, that's often hard. But I think what we've seen is as you generate momentum, the market sort of plays that role. So as places gain momentum for certain types of consumers, the restaurants and retailers that, that want to attract those consumers see that as an opportunity and it becomes this sort of self-fulfilling. And I think Clarendon is an example, right? The idea that a niche was created there and then other like retailers came in and said, I want to be part of that because that's where my traffic is. So I think, uh, and one of the things we can talk about in terms of enhanced business support and the legacy side, but also we've talked a little bit about, but we didn't spend much time on this is, you know, the idea of branding and marketing is also perhaps about getting a better landlord community down there that can really sort of engage with each other in a meaningful way, which they've all asked for. So it's not bringing them to the table unwillingly to have the conversations about how do we work together to make sure that the, that the volume and pipeline of tenants is consistent and that we're saying the same story and that we are getting, because everyone sort of wins when there's tenants out there looking for space. So I think the brand, so the branding, and it seems to me CPRO doing it would be really good. CPRO needs to work on its own branding, which I found out, I was talking to, to Kim, she said that she found out that the Columbia Pike Blues Festival, almost nobody realizes that that's some, a CPRO activity. They do all these things and nobody realizes it's CPRO. Yeah. The, the other thing that has occurred to me, and nobody's really talked about so much, so the Pike is also a transportation corridor, and you, we've got all kinds of traffic going back and forth, right? Um, and so those are potential, potential customers, right? They're going to work or whatever, but something might catch their eye, okay? Which gets us to branding and signs. Um, and I think we'll probably get into signs later, but I've, and I think, I don't know if it was shared with you, my, my experience at the Harris Teeters, where, I mean, I even knew where I was going. I couldn't find the parking sign, I mean, that's that's a, particular along the pike if somebody's going to stop at something they got to know where they're going to put their car and if you can't see a sign on where to put it it's going to be really really hard um, and so I think I assume we'll get into that more but I think the, the the code and some zoning things that we have that make it so businesses can't brand can't put out signs 
makes it impossible for them to actually do what they need to do, and I'm very supportive of finding some changes. Because we have the form-based code, does that allow us to do, can we do some things just there that are special, like pilots? Like, so for example, you have a new business, you know, and maybe any new business that comes in for a year, you have a pilot, you can do different kinds of signs or something that gets us out of this, um, always, it's gonna set a precedent, and oh no, we can't do that, and all the discussions we have with our could if I, I, table if I that could, though, I think yeah, that's yes, yeah, you that's absolutely the can. I, I apologize so. for segueing and my already. My colleagues can two. join me up here, so I don't say anything. No, no, that's fine. I'll, I'm just, I'll just put it out there. Thank you. So branding, yes, let's do it. And I'm fine to have CPRO help. And the cost thing is another issue. I'll be interested to hear what. Suggest. All right. So uh, I, I'll join in on this conversation. So uh, first, and I appreciate um, well everyone's comments, but I want to piggyback on things that were. Um, you know, surfaced by Mr. Gutschall and Ms. Crystal. When we think about neighborhood serving retail, I mean, I can, I can, I hear that, and I, I hear two things: not only the consumer base, but also the scale of the retail establishments. I mean, they're not sized to, you know, bring in 50 cars at one time to eat dinner. It's there to serve a more limited flow. Is that fair? Well, with the exception of grocery stores, which obviously right, are, right. are very large drivers right. of traffic. But right. Yeah, and I think uh, even restaurants, I think, you know, the size of restaurants always varies, and but smaller tends to be more successful in terms of um, uh, maintaining the cost structure of the, of the rents. But. And as I think about analogs, would something like Del Rey, would that be considered neighborhood serving retail? Yeah, I mean, and, and Stephen, you can also weigh in on this, but, I, I, but you know, our experience would... With Delray, it started off as neighborhood serving and still very much is. I think its success as a neighborhood serving has 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 allowed it to leak into sort of destination because it is such a successful. And that's kind of where I was trying to get to. But, but, know, but it did start. It started. It didn't try to be a destination. It became a very very well positioned neighborhood serving market, and just through the success of that and the quality of the tenants, other people started figuring it out as a hidden gem and started now making that part of their their consumer choices of where to say go out to eat. Right, and, and that for me is kind of an instructive case study, um, you know, in a place that, um, you know, built its neighborhood assets that became gems to a certain privileged few and then have widely been embraced by others. And, you know, while it's still neighborhood serving retail, it drives a fair amount of destination traffic just because of the quality of what's offered and the uniqueness of what is offered. Um, and in some ways, I, I see that as being pivotal for Columbia Pike because even though we don't have, as, as Ms. Crystal brought up, the existential problem of swaths of vacancy that we're trying to fill, I'm pretty sure that a lot of the, um, the, the retail operators are, are vulnerable and are looking for a little bit more stability in terms of their customer base and would love to see some strengthen something or other, which you know can certainly come from making sure people in the neighborhoods know more about them and frequent them. But you know, I, I can't imagine they would they would turn their nose at having a kind of Delray cachet in the community where people are traveling to visit a, a taqueria or or someplace else unique on the pike. So I don't know how you actually effectuate that with marketing and branding, but that's where other smart people come in. And I think at least figuring out how we we do that, how we take advantage of what is, figure out from the business owners what they need and, and what's within the capacity of us to actually move the dial on with branding and marketing. I'm, I'm very much for figuring that out. I don't know what the dollars are. I, I don't know what the process is. Let you smart people figure that out. But um, I, I certainly endorse that, that approach because uh, you know, there seems to me there, there's, we don't have this existential problem, but it also seems like there's an opportunity gap between where we can be with Columbia Pike that we're not quite hitting. And, you know, figuring that out, I think, is important. Uh, we, we do have one uh, risk going forward, which is that the places that have the most strength is our legacy buildings. Well, some of those legacy buildings will be redeveloped. And even if someone wanted to stay in the exact same spot, um, they have to survive for two years while that spot is torn down and rebuilt. And so we have legacy businesses in legacy spaces that are facing a transition. Um, CPRO is one of those organizations facing that transition. And so we have to be able to help them 
and have a strong overall market for the pike so that as people find a new landing space, they can succeed there. Instead of having, um, we now have, uh, it took us years, but we have a Starbucks. That was the third business in that spot. So, you know, we want people to be able to come and land and stay and thrive so that we don't, um, we don't create a problem through redevelopment that, we're taking, that we have strong businesses that are then displaced and no one can come in and fill that space after the redevelopment is done. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think we'll definitely get more into that with the second recommendation. Any others on this first? So I, I think you have general guidance that there's there there to pr pursue and scope. Um, so great. great. Thank you. These, these are going to get easier, not harder. No, I'm just kidding. They're going to get harder. <laughs> <laughs> you already did this one, right? Uh, the second one obviously relates to the increased use flexibility. Um, as a matter of background, just so everyone understands the context, the form based code has already been amended over time to allow for more flexibility, particularly in the retail plan, added in a lot more flexible county, flexibility countywide with things like retail equivalents and other things. Those were uh, replicated within the form based code and a lot of other. Countywide procedures obviously live within the form-based code. Things like retail equivalents, as I mentioned, being administratively approved, and then other uses allowed by use permits, such as child care and other uses. But there are some uses that are identified as part of uh, uh, discussions, not only as a technical exercise in the market study, but also discussion with stakeholders that either are completely prohibited or very limited, or at least a lot of the um, landlords believe are very limited in terms of, um, of uses on, ground, on the form-based code ground floor projects. And those include office and creative workspaces, things like galleries and, and, and other arts uses that were seen as more passive users of space. And this is really a county-wide issue, but we'll talk about how maybe Columbia Pike could help progress this idea forward. Of, as we look at a lot of uses that are now only allowed in our M1 because they're viewed as industrial, the world has changed and things like maker spacers, pet grooming and boarding, commercial kitchens, brewery, distilleries, um, are often now not only sort of appropriate in, in certain urban environments, but are often the anchors that sort of allow places in transition to sort of have that unique flavor. So the recommendation uh, is that we look into expanding expanded uses uh, only in form-based code projects on Columbia Pike. Uh, Ms. Garvey, we, we are, you see that signs are not on here. There are a lot of other issues, and I think we can talk about why we want to keep a uh, focus on uses as, as a short-term process and that there's many other, um, I think, issues that I think are related that I think we'll continue to have conversations about. But this is really about a short-term zoning uh, uh, ordinance amendment process that identifies the new uses and an amendment acted upon by county board. We, we really were focused on something timely, um, I think, and not expanding it into something that took months, years to sort of struggle with, but really of the idea of how do we create a short-term process that allows some flexibility and see where it goes. So we would look at a discrete set of uses, so this wouldn't be opening up to broad categories, but really a discrete set of uses. Um, we will consider as part of this analysis um, whether some uses uh, make more sense as buy right versus which ones maybe make more sense as use permit options. Um, and that also relates to things like do we want to put terms on them, uh, obviously, a lot of our use permits, as you guys are well aware, have, have check-ins and, and renewals uh, and have standards. So do we want to have uses that we allow but only under certain standards, things like uh, design, impact on pedestrian experience, transparency, parking, those sort of things. Um, and the outcome is to, is to really assess the performance of the new uses and amend the zoning ordinance as needed. So the, the discussion is really of is there a value uh, of, of uh, potential challenges, and we were told not to use pilot, so I, I, I apologize, but of, of a short-term ZOA process to look at form-based code projects, and also is that, is that, the, is that the right limit, form-based code projects versus non-form-based code projects, and then what are the pros and cons of buy right versus use permit regarding method of approval, timing, and costs. Uh, once again, we don't want to create a process that says more flexibility, but then the process becomes so burdensome no one wants to take it, uh, take it on. Application of criteria and standards, sunsetting of approvals, um, and what type of process and community engagement and what, what would be the impact on timing? And so sort of, and, 
and then blending into sort of some final guidance on sort of next steps to come back to you with, 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 if, with whatever process you so choose. Okay, we're landing here. Ms. Garvey, I imagine you want to reiterate your interest in this subject area? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm going to talk about all of this and I'll get to science again later, but I'll just talk about this. I mean, I, looking at, all, at what you have here, discussion, I mean, for me, I'd like us to do whatever we can do the fastest, the easiest, and, you know, with the least cost and fuss. That's what I, I mean, I think this is what we want to do. And, you know, you, you can tell me what is going to do fastest, easiest, and least fuss that makes sense. Is that guidance? Yeah. No. <laughs> Does that I'm count? Looking around for do the planning college. Yeah, and do it now. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you. Mr. Gutschall. Uh, thank you. We already have um, a, 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 a regime, if you will, for regulating uh, uh, retail equivalents, right, in our site plan projects in Metro quarters. So is this not really pretty simple, as simple as taking that and, and porting it over to the form-based code? Because when you talk about looking in and, and sort of zeroing in on the specific specific uses and, and really trying to you know tease out what would be admin versus what would be use permit, are we creating a, a new regime that looks like that, or can we just port that regime over to here? Uh, well, the, the retail equivalent process countywide is already totally. within the form-based code. This is really about discrete uses that the zoning administrator said that doesn't really meet. That's an office. That's not a retail equivalent. And we and the, the, the line that we've tried to meet is always a question of sort of case by case, right? But I think some of the um, discussion was things like ground floor office, if appropriately designed, um, we shouldn't be trying to hide them under the retail equivalent, but we also should be, should be saying let's create a process through which they're, um, they have a clear path to approval or not. Uh, or at least have, let's have that discussion. Um, and then it's a lot of the other uses, like the light industrial and things like that, once again, really wouldn't fall into retail equivalents. They really are uses defined in the zoning ordinance, and it would really be about amending the zoning ordinance to allow those types of uses in the form-based code. Okay, but then we would only do it for the form-based code. We would not expand that. that that's the recommendation in, in, in a general sense, but it's really up for discussion. Is that the, really the question? Yeah, I mean, my not wanting, in the interest of moving forward quickly, not wanting to bite off more than we can chew, I'm okay with going with just the form-based code, but from a really big picture point of view, I would rather have one regime for how we regulate ground floor uses that is across all of our corridors. Mm -hmm. All right, I recognize myself, I'll say I don't generally disagree with that. I do fear how long it will take for us to do a process to, uh, to get there, and we might wanna, for the sake of, of doing something innovative and being responsive, just think about limiting it here. I do wanna maybe ask a couple of questions before giving some perspectives. So if we can go back to the previous slide, which goes through some of the, or maybe it's, yeah, that, that one, yeah. So thinking about what we're, we're missing, <clears throat> you know, when, when this work was socialized with me with earlier briefings, um, you know, I found the conversation about brewers and distilleries and how that's evolved as a truly industrial use to something that is almost indistinguishable from current low intensity retail uses to be fascinating. But then I start to think about, and I'm gonna throw a lot out here and I realize they're not all solved by this. When you think about Arlington and retail specifically, uh, you know, whether it's places in the district that have Union Market, for example, or what is it, the, um, the one in Annandale, uh, the box, is that what it's called? Uh, anyway, it's these, these you know, very interesting uh, incubator, um, what do you, food hall kind of spaces, and you think about a number of interesting niche products that exist elsewhere that don't exist in Arlington. And it seems weird given that we have the same demographics, and you wonder you know, why things that are you know, um, created in, in other places, seem to be successful, don't necessarily catch on here. So I, I love bringing flexibility to the table if it can maybe surface, if not those exact examples, some other things, which just might find a, a, an interesting niche. I'm curious, the commercial kitchens piece, now we've recently done the uh, La Cocina uh, in Gilliam Place, 
have we solved that particular issue? And that's one where I think further study would be Got needed. I think, I think that's why we, we presented it as prohibited or limited or maybe even misunderstood. So some right. of this, the good news, some of this may be just about, be about clarifying right. and providing one place where someone can say these are the uses that are allowed. And by the way, this was always allowed or we already fixed it. And just so everyone knows. So yeah, but I think the, the challenge of those is that when they're sort of the first time you do them and you don't have the overarching zoning, you have to sort of sort of meander your way to an approval. Got it, got it. Um, and maybe this is a question for Ms. Flanagan Watson. Um, you know, is you've spent so much time working with businesses to sort of solve problems and navigate our structures and bureaucracies. Do you have a sense, could we develop a sense as an organization of, you know, organizations, businesses that have queried the county to try and set up shop, but who have abandoned those efforts because it was either not permissible or too hard. Do we have any sense of the range of what that might be? In terms of numbers or types of businesses? Types. Anything that's useful for us figuring out how to move forward with a, not a pilot. So do we have a good sampling? Um, it's, it's probably on the smaller side yeah. to go out and to get some feedback, yes. Okay. I think we could go out and reach out and to get some feedback. That's something that we do on an ongoing basis. Yeah. Uh, and I know many uh, would be interested in sharing feedback, particularly if it's gonna make it easier for them to do business or for others to do business. Right. Okay, thank you. Real quick thought. Mr. Gutschall and then Mr. DeFerranti. Um, just to make sure that on this, the list of uses that they would, the process as set up would allow for others to put in suggestions like urban ag and things like that, right? That yeah, this is just a, such as. Right, uh, okay. The, part, the first part of the study would be determine what uses we're studying. Okay, Mr. DeFranti. So that's very helpful. I'm favorably inclined. I do. It does look like, Mr. Snyder, you might have a thought or two, and I wanted to get your perspective Why on this. Why don't you be recognized, and then we'll do Ms. Crystal, and then, I mean, just to keep the, the order and the flow. Sure. We're that's casual, fine. but we're not abandoning all rules today. Sure. <laughs> In due course. All right, Ms. Crystal. Sure. Um, so I think, uh, Mr. Rissi, your line of question was actually really helpful about uh, who do we know that wanted to take advantage of this that couldn't? Um, and I think, I mean, there's no like secret about why pilots are not a good word, is we don't do spot zoning in Arlington County in Ramos because that's illegal. We don't say this is a use we want, we're gonna shape a, a, a very specific call it pilot spot zoning or whatever else to enable it. We amend our zoning ordinance such that it can be considered throughout the, um, the district in this case, or, or maybe even around the county as Mr. Gutschall was indicating. So I, I think the question that I have here a little bit, I, I'm generally very supportive of get out of the way, right, and let these uses bloom. But have we fully considered um, that this might be an opportunity to invite in uh, not just the incredibly hip uh, food hall, but a true commercial kitchen for somebody who, you know, really wants to run a commercial operation out of the pike with all of the attendant um, trucks uh, and heavy duty vehicles um, that is not necessarily community serving and, and fun and funky, but truly a, a M1 use. So, um, I respect that I think that the sophistication of, of both the economic development team and our staff team, but I, I think before we amend our zoning ordinance first and ask questions later, uh, it would make sense to really try to figure out what are the, um, uh, this is sort of the wrong term because it sounds like I'm talking about use permits, I'm not, the use cases, right? What are the instances of um, creative entities we know about, to Mr. Dorsey's point, that might have operated here what else do we know about um, the uh, uh, thinking of the property owners, the, uh, the, the rental rates and so forth, and let's take a really clear-eyed look at what type of product we're likely to get. Um, is it something, again, fun and funky, like the food hall, or is it like the more traditional commercial kitchen? Thank you. All right. Ms. Garvey, and then Mr. Snyder, if you have something to say, we'll go to you afterwards. Actually, I'll, I'm, I, I, can I yield to Mr. Snyder? You can, but I may not yield you back. But. Oh, <laughs> Mr. Dorsey. If, go if, ahead, John. If I could try to answer that point, uh, we do have a consensus uh, among the businesses and the property owners and the residents, which is to remove restrictions on types of businesses because all of us recognize that we're not the innovators who are gonna come up with this great idea. Um, if you had asked me many years ago, would a, 
a place that only sells burgers and fries on the pike, would that thrive? Two blocks from Burger King and two blocks from McDonald's. Of course not. That's five guys, right? <laughs> so that's why I'm not, you know, anyway. Yeah. But these folks have... On a billion yes, that's right. <laughs> but these None folks the have the ideas, and what we should look at is, you know, the differentiator is how many vehicles per day is this going to be? Not whether you're La Casina or a commercial kitchen that's feeding out to... 27 food trucks or something like that, but how many vehicles per day? Let's look at the, the noxious things like <coughs> noise and fumes that would be coming from an operation as opposed to the usage and, and look at it that way. So it would be more open than what's being proposed here um, and it might be encompassed by your point of, but bring us ideas also. You know, he, here are some things that can move through on a faster track, but here are some other ideas that we have to look at, but let's throw it open. It is a revitalization district that gives some opportunities to try things that you may not be comfortable trying countywide. All right, Ms. Garvey. Thank you. I like Mr. Schneider's suggestion because I think the original reason we had loose permits for things was so we didn't get things with noxious fumes and stuff. We just decided we had to enumerate all of them. So I, I like your approach. So I'd like to get back to science. So we have, so if we do a wonderful job with this flexibility and we get these wonderful companies going down and people are driving by and they can't find a place to park, well, actually, let's start. They don't even know they exist because there are no signs out. So how are they going to get business? And then if they, and then if people know they're there and they can't park, how are they? Gonna, so I'm, I'm just worried if we don't solve the issue for telling people where they can, how they can actually get to the store and knowing that the store is there, we can do all this wonderful work and it won't be as effective. Does that make sense? It seems to. Can we do something about signs? Mark said I could plead the fifth on the science question. Okay. I mean, we can. We. I, I, think, I mean, we can stop here. I just really want to do something about science. That's all. No, I'd just like to recognize myself for a second, just to say that um, I don't want to come across as not thinking that signage is not important. Okay. It is, but that is not necessarily the only way that you can be successful. Referencing the Del Rey experience that I'm talking about here before, you can't see signs until you're up on a building. Mm -hmm. um, it's 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 perhaps a piece of the puzzle, not the entire answer. And I know we've got these larger signage conversations, not just um, you know, here, but also throughout the county. I, I, my personal opinion is I remain convinced that there's, there are other elements to the retail puzzle that we should really focus our attention on trying to solve, not dissuade ourselves into thinking that more and bigger signage is gonna all of a sudden make a business successful. So, and I don't think that's the case at all. I just think it's a key thing. And I will say, I've been thinking about the Delray. The, the issue that I think we have is this node issue. Delray, people get out of their car and they walk around because it's really nice. So you stop and you see things. Unfortunately, the Pike still has got, it's a corridor and it's a lot harder for that kind of a, anyway, you need different approaches for different kind of things. And I suspect we need a different approach. There. No, I, I certainly yeah. don't disagree. I, I've had many conversations with uh, people on the Pike and I think many people know I, I live off of Columbia Pike, but more toward the Western end. And, you know, I just seen too many experiences where uh, places that are in hard to access locations still nonetheless have very vibrant clientele and I, I'm not here to say why those reasons are, but you know, sometimes you have to look at your price points, what you offer, and the quality of what that is. is, is and, and, I'm, and again, I'm, I'm not indicting any particular one business, but I've just seen way too many examples of places that are god awful from <laughs> a location and a signage perspective that are nonetheless really healthy and successful to believe that it's, no, it's, it's not the only thing. The only right. thing. And just to be clear, as another Pike resident, it's not as though signs are not allowed on Columbia Pike and everything's a speakeasy <laughs> no. and you have to know where to find it. There, there are a lot of store signage on Columbia but Pike. But a speakeasy would be cool. There we go, we'll take it. <laughs> and Paging Rob Kapika. Uh, so it's, I really associate myself yeah. with Mr. Mr. Gutschall. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually just wanted to very quickly uh, agree 100% with Mr. Snyder on his comment about that. I don't think it's the role of the county to pick the winners and losers. Retail is, we're in the midst of a huge transformation. We are still coming to grips with what is the result of, what's the future of bricks and mortar? I don't think anyone could sit here today and understand what, how that, this is gonna play out. We know it's gonna evolve quite a bit and I think our role here is to 
is to not focus on the uses. So I am a little concerned about that aspect that there's that we're trying to create the new list. I would rather focus on let's mitigate the impact. Let's make sure that we avoid the the noxious uses, the noxious impacts of whether that be be traffic or noise or fumes or any of those sorts of things, um, and really try to let's get out of the way and allow for the, the smarter people to figure out and the brave people because there's gonna, be, there's gonna be a whole lot of folks that try things that don't make it, but it's not for us to pick the winners and losers. All right, anybody on that side wanna comment on this? All right, Mr. McCauley, I think when you're ready, we're ready to move to the next item. Okay. So number three, enhanced business support. So the strategic frame response was provide enhanced support for businesses and legacy spaces specifically uh, relocation retention efforts for businesses affected by redevelopment. Um, again, as a background, um, much like in the first issue, uh, as a reminder, AED provides support services through primarily through our biz launch program, but other services countywide. Um, I think we, we, we try to serve the, 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 as many of the uh, opportunities that are in front of us. We try to be proactive, but we don't have someone that is a Columbia Pike person and or could we, if, if, if um, given the resources? So um, the threat to of redevelopment to these spaces, often we find ourselves sort of reacting to the outcome. We uh, site plan gets our use permit gets approved, um, and we are then trying to sort of sort of um, catch up. So the recommendation is, at least as a starting point, and then we'll get into some good discussion and for further ideas, is whether we consider looking at increased sports services focused on this part of the county, which is still relatively unique in terms of, has, is the least mature in terms of its redevelopment pattern. There's a lot more redevelopment to go, and so we have a lot more of these instances. Uh, starting with enhanced outreach efforts and further uh, consideration of strategic relocation support. And again, the recommendation on the table is that at least as a starting off point, that CPRO as the boots on the ground would be the right organization to provide to, 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 to begin that process, even if it's just having a little more uh, capacity to do outreach, to talk to these businesses, to find out what are their th real threats, why, why wouldn't they consider moving to a new location on the pike versus outside, what are, the, what, what are their real decision factors? And then obviously partnering with our existing um, uh, services and AED in terms of our small business support. So the discussion and guidance is what types of assistance could be considered and what are the general pros and cons of each approach, including just enhanced outreach, intel gathering, relocation services and counseling, um, using use permits to, to provide uh, some, some relief. Uh, and then, and <coughs> once again, this list is not in terms of our recommendations, just for discussion, uh, financial accredited assistance. Um, and then what is the general criteria for the types of businesses that would benefit from the program and our policy? And then what is the appropriate role of AAD and CPRO respectively relative to the county manager's recommendation? Great. All right, Mr. Gutschall, you were quick at the uh, ready. Uh, thank you. So um, generally supportive of, of where you're headed here, and, and I do think CPRO is a, is a great partner in, in this, and so I would support some additional resources to CPRO to, to help lead this. What I am um, wanted to try to formulate here, though, was how, what, what else am I looking for? I feel like something is sort of missing here, and what I'm getting at is I think that is, is understanding the nuance of, of what are all of the things, the actual barriers to, to business. And you referenced this kind of, and, and I think in, our, in a conversation we had a couple weeks ago, we talked about, uh, for example, an owner of an existing coffee shop um, that's in a legacy building that is slated for what, you know, for redevelopment and what would prevent him from wanting to move. And I think you get some of these legacy owners, they're not used to, for example, if they're, if they're, if they're used to uh, relying on the availability of surface parking and they don't quite know how to adapt their business model or how to have some confidence that actually you may not need the surface parking when you've got more people that are within walking distance, but you might have to evolve how you how you market yourself, how you put stuff, you know, how you do your displays and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, so counseling and working through some of the, you know, use permits and greasing the, the skids to make sure that it's an easy transition in terms of this physical space to that physical space is one thing, but also helping folks to evolve in their understanding of that 
they're now going to be in a new market where they, the space they move to is likely to have higher rent, is likely to have you know, different demands on them. It's a different structure. So I don't know how technical you think that we can get with helping folks to make that kind of transition, but that's where I think that there is some real opportunity to, to make this more than just, I, I, this is more than lip service, so I don't mean it to sound diminutive that way, but to really put some oomph behind this that we are actually really gonna fundamentally help some existing legacy businesses tran trans transform as they transition. And uh, thank you for that comment, and, and, and I agree. I think the question of what you do is, is sort of, I, but I think we have, to, we have to take the first step, which is I think we haven't had the resources to date neither the CPRO to even have the conversations early enough, and I think um, having those conversations at the, at the 11th hour of a, of a business's decision is always going to be less productive because, because whether it's true or not, in the business owner's mind, the decision's already been made, right? <laughs> versus having a longer history of communication and outreach. So I don't think it's, I think it's as much about gathering that information and knowing when early in the process we can start talking about, hey, if you, with, our, with, our, with any resource CPRO has as well as our biz launch team, hey, have you thought about moving into a new space and do you need help thinking about how the lease structure is different and all those other things. But it's, but it's hard when we're reacting to it. When sure. it's, because it's, because that business owner says that's a lot to take on. I've already decided to, to go somewhere else that has a very similar environment to what I'm in now, even if it's not in Arlington or Columbia Pike. Okay, we're just gonna come on down the line. Ms. Crystal. Um, so I wanted to, let me follow up with a first question about something Mr. Gretchel was saying. One of the things that I've really struggled with when we talk about these businesses, um, you know, what, what sometimes is perception among those of us who are residents on the Pike, maybe compared to what you actually hear from landlords, is whether it's actually true that rent is more expensive when, when the retailer comes back to a redeveloped building. I know that was sort of, had to be part of the, the analysis that you all did about average rents. Um, is that true? I mean, can, you, can we substantiate, is rent more expensive in a new building than it is in an older building? Well, and by how much? Yeah, I, and I think, I think Mr. Gutschall it perfectly, it's sort of when we talk about rent, it's rent terms are different. Oh. Um, and so rent, actual rental cost is just one factor. Things like <coughs> terms, things like credit, uh, things like the cost of fitting out new space versus staying in old space and not having to spend a lot of money and how much the landlord is willing to contribute in tenant improvements versus expect the, the retailer to. So the, 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 the chains have this down to a science. They understand the lease terms. They often yeah. enforce them on, upon landlords and they have the step-by-step the, the -step way of fitting out space and having that. A smaller uh, business owner may say, that's just a lot to take on, and the rent number then becomes just part of the equation. It's a lot of other things like, how do I get credit? How, mm -hmm. do, I, how do I provide the credit for a sure. five-year lease? Boy, that's a, if, I, if I go out of business in two years, that's a huge liability. So those things are really, I see. and some of those things are what we talk about when we, t when, when we talk about counseling early on, yeah. about helping businesses understand, and our biz lunch team and Alex, you can land, does a great job at helping businesses that are moving out of their living room into space for uh -huh. the first time and understanding the difference between a commercial lease and a residential lease and all those other things that are very important for business to know. And this is just another step in that process. I really appreciate that. I think um, that's kind of an example. It, it's definitely true that it can sound like counseling and support is just sort of lift service. And I think that's a really good example of how it is solving an actual, whether it's an a information asymmetry or, or otherwise a very real problem. Um, I will say that I am most excited about this body of work. I think, again, coming back to that question I was asking with problem one about the extent I, I see a real problem on the pike, it is losing our legacy businesses. It's, it's what I worry about as a resident, as a board member. And so I'm really excited to have some specifics and maybe to have CPRO's help, right, in, in being able to do this counseling role uh, in, in co cooperation with AED. Um, I am not sure yet what the specifics might look like, but I, I think we have a great analog, actually, which is, um, what the form-based code says to residents of the Pike, residential residents of the Pike who are worried about displacement. And I think, you know, in real credit to, to Mr. Snyder and, and so many of the neighbors who are involved in the shaping of the form-based code, you know, sort of getting into the details aside, I, I think what the form-based code and the neighborhoods plan really does is it kind of makes a promise to renters. So our renters who are in market rate um, uh, apartments 
that are at risk of redevelopment, which is that if you hang with us, we will come up with a relocation plan for you. And, and we are gonna invite you to have a home, a permanent home back in the pike, because we expect a certain number um, of replacement committed affordable units. And so um, the way that plays out, there is always disruption, there is always information and destabilization, and we worry about that displacement. But there is that commitment baked into our plans. And I would love if we would be able to get to that kind of commitment to say to our legacy retailers, you know, our beloved kind of small businesses, which is, yes, the pike is changing and transitioning. That's by design. Um, we, we hope that you'll believe that you have a home in a mixed use urban environment as well as a suburban strip wall. If you're willing to take that bet, we are here to help you during the transition and welcoming you back. Whether it is the counseling support to help you make um, heads or tails of these really confusing documents um, uh, on your new rental, whether it is helping you, I could see maybe with the tenant improvements, right? That's that's an area where maybe small grants can make a difference from the county um, or, or other support. So again, I don't know what the specifics are, but I think we have an analogy in how we've we've uh, committed to, to our longstanding residents that they should and will have a home in the future of a redeveloped pike. I think it'd be wonderful if we could get to a point where we feel like we could have the policy tools and the administrative tools to make a similar commitment to our longstanding legacy businesses. Ms. Garvey. Yeah, I can even pick up right there. I absolutely agree with you. It was some time ago I suddenly realized that we talk about affordable housing all the time. It's the same thing for small businesses. Um, and the one thing, um, this, it's, it's, it's a, it would be a heavy lift to figure out because I, I do believe, Ms. Crystal, I could be wrong, but I think the costs are really quite significant and that there's some businesses, small businesses, that they just, with the newer costs, they just can't make it. So they need some supported housing um, or a form of, you know, a place that they can count on that the price isn't going to go up. And I don't know how we're going to do that, but we do do things like that for arts, we've done arts incubators, we've done... Anyway, I think if we want to keep Arlington, Arlington, and we want to keep these pla these places that really make us feel like home, um, we're going to have to do something different. So that's not what's up here, but I am very interested in working on that. And every now and then, I, try, I sit down and talk with Mr. McIsaac and try to see us in a way we can figure out how to do this. Um, on this particular issue, I, I think this is great and absolutely the way to go. And actually, Ms. Crystal, I was thinking before, you weren't so comfortable with the, the money for the branding and stuff. I think branding or fits right in here, actually, with all of these kind of things, so that there would be a purpose to it. Um, it would be tied in with specific building a specific place. Um, and certainly, CPO can have an overall plan. I think this will fit really well with CPO, because what I understand talking to Ms. Klingler, as I said earlier, I mean, a lot of the, the businesses, they don't, they don't really realize that CPO hardly exists and what they can provide. And she says, once they realize we can provide things for them, they, they're, they're then willing to contribute. So this may be a way of getting CPO kind of stepped up, seeing there's more value, pump up the businesses, they put money into CPO, and then we don't have to support CPO so much anymore. Um, so priming the pump, if you will. I, I think it's great. Um, I think it's a really good use of um, CPO because I think it's hand-holding these legacy buildings. It's everybody's going to have a different problem and a different concern. I know our, um, I've thought back when I talk about the signage, it's not just the most recent instance. I, re I remember talking with Rob Krupika and the donut. I think, Shannon, were you with me at that meeting? I mean, he went through what it was like to try to open his business on the pike. It was a nightmare. And a lot of it was kind of our regulation. And you know, you can't get that until you get this. And you can't get this until you get that. You can't get this until you open. And then when you can't open, I mean, it was just, it was really a nightmare. I think maybe we fixed some of it, I hope. Um, but it's that sort of thing that um, he could have used really help um, and hand-holding. And if we can provide that here, I think it would be great and provide a great model maybe around the county. So I'm extremely um, supportive of doing this. And what I see is the role, I see CPO as kind of being a force multiplier for AED. I think that's kind of a way of putting it. And I think that's great. And I think they're, up, they're ready to step up and do that. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeFranti. So a uh, few quick points. I've been a little bit holding off till we got the third item. Uh, I am fully in sync with Ms. Crystal and, and others have mentioned it. Um, the opportunity cost idea and this one, item three, seems more attractive to me than item one at the moment for funding, particularly in light of what I see is likely to be the year to come, 2020. Um, in light of what is going on along the pike and will be going on along the pike. So uh, three more than one, though, you know, open to one. Um, I see full support for your number two of the three different options. I don't see, think anyone has mentioned anything. With respect to the three questions identified here, I don't feel 
particularly qualified on Big Bullet 1 or Big Bullet 2 to offer thoughts, but I do agree with colleagues that CPRO feels to me like a little bit better of the venue to provide this information at the moment than AED. Uh, um, and then last, maybe I can ask for the help at some point. I think, Mr. Chair, your, your reference to neighborhood services, it's been a while since I've been to the Pan American. There are a number of different, I, I feel like I need to understand a little bit more granularly what neighborhood services are and how slides five and 12 of what you presented fit. I did scan the full report and pages 86 and 96 talk a little bit about this, but I think the right way to do it is to see if I can get your time, John, just to, or whoever's appropriate, and if, if and only if, depending on the time you have, Mark, and walk it a little bit because I don't live along the pike and I've you know, spent a lot of time, but until I know things a little bit better, um, I won't be best able to, to provide you feedback on this. Thank you. You know, for, for me, I'll just say this is one where I think we're really going to need to sharpen our policy pencils to figure this out because this is going to be hard to execute. Um, I think we probably are all in the same place in terms of desiring um, to be able to support or to reduce the, the impact of an involuntary dislocation of a treasured valued business. What becomes really hard is one defining specifically uh, what, what that is, what business that is, because as we know along the pike occupying these legacy spaces, you have uh, entities relating to the uh, mom and pop unique, um, you know, South American restaurant to, um, you know, a wonderful cafe that offers live entertainment to people who take advantage of low income people with usurious loans. You can tell which one I'm probably not interested in helping, um, but they still occupy these so-called legacy spaces. So crafting a public policy which, uh, you know, does account for that distinction to me is vitally important um, to the nth degree. So, you know, there's, there's that, though I don't say that to diminish our sharpening our pencils and pursuing that work. It's just one of those things that I recognize is going to be really difficult. Um, <clears throat> I do have a question in here, so I know we have just a few things that we've thrown out there, but do we have any sense, maybe and this is for, for Stephen from H, HRNA, do other communities, I can't imagine we're the only ones to have ever dealt with this problem, and are there you know, other policy ideas like tax abatement for, you know, for example, businesses with new space that find it hard to lease who are willing to work with the community to um, temporarily or permanently locate let's say in this case is the legacy businesses that we're able to better define, I mean, are, are these kinds of tools that other people employ to make this happen? Yeah, definitely. Um, and we highlight some of them in the full version of Got the report. It. Got it. Different types of actions and initiatives specifically around like, tax abatements, as you mentioned, or Got other it. sort of financial incentives that you might provide. Um, and it really varies depending on what your specific sort of objective is. Right. Um, okay. But so our, our toolkit expands beyond what we have here for us to really look at. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's why I think the HRA sort of broad-based strategy toolkit, while none of the individual items were given a level of analysis that we'll need to go through to get to a policy, I think, provide us a really good sort of uh, roadmap on sort of things we can look at. I, I'll also say sort of what, what we've looked at across in other areas is and this really relates to Ms. Crystal's question, is things like credit enhancement sometimes are used, mm -hmm. which is that the, the, the barrier is not that the local coffee shop can, can't make as much money at a coffee shop as Starbucks. They just don't have the credit to, to land that space. So I know places have looked at that as a way of sort of, so, and I, and I only raise that because that may not be the right answer, but it's really about doing the legwork on what are the real pain points and what are the real barriers, and then providing the right levers that strategically sort of, sort of at least mitigate some of those barriers. So I don't think we'll, I think we'll have to think about what the first what those challenges are, and then come back with mm -hmm. these are the right tools for them. No, that's 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 excellent. And um, the next piece in terms of, well, I, I guess just more of an observation. Uh, mm -hmm. But it seems that our, our newer businesses, in addition to having higher vacancy, also 
both on the pike and really elsewhere throughout the county usually take a significant amount of time to, to lease up. And so I'm, I'm just wondering if through combination of incentives, but also there being a natural market <coughs> incentive, maybe we can figure out some way of directly working with people who um, build spaces where it seems to be that they're building it because they know that they can deliver um, sold housing units or occupied housing units right away and the retail is, if not a design or programmatic afterthought, just the market is just not there yet to have that retail take hold right away with the exception of the most recent entry to the pike, which seems to come fully leased with retail. Congratulations, Mr. Orr. Um, but for the most part, that is not the norm. So it seems that there, there should be willing partners on the terms, you know, there, there are a few spaces on the pike that took years to uh, have the, the retail lease up, and that's not uncommon in Arlington for new spaces. So it seems like we can figure, figure something out there. All right, I'm rambling, so I'll move on to Mr. Gutshaw. Actually, just because you, you spurred it in my mind, I think you're right on, Mr. Chair, which is what we come up with here, I think, hopefully this goes without saying, but I wanna make sure that we plant the seed, which is, you know, we're gonna, as we're moving forward with a uh, plans for the Lee Highway Corridor, where we're gonna have legacy businesses, a lot of, um, a lot of those kinds of businesses that are beloved, um, and where we wanna see them be able to remain not necessarily remain, it's kind of like how we, the new thing, it's not age in place, it's age in the community. And it's sort of with these businesses, it's not so much remain in their exact spot, but it's a, it's a, uh, it's a transition plan to allow them to, to remain in, in the community. And so I think the work that we're doing here is gonna have applicabil applicability on Lee Highway. And then the only other final closing thought on this is I am so grateful for this work and that this is coming forward to the board I remember um, back in the uh, uh, Clarendon sector plan update, and Ms. Smith may remember this as well, there was a lot of, con this similar conversation about what was happening to the businesses, the legacy businesses in Clarendon, and the answer at that time was, don't worry, they'll just relocate over to the edges, to 10th Street, for example, and that clearly has not happened. And so that was not, you know, it was best of intentions, but it wasn't enough. And so the fact that we are acknowledging that we have to do more for these legacy businesses that we have to do more, that if we really want to see the pike achieve its full potential, and it's interesting that, Ms. Crystal, your point about what is the problem we're trying to solve, that it's not, it, you, I don't think you can look at just, you know, vacancy rates, because there is the point of, of vulnerability. Or if we have businesses that are there, but if there's rapid turnover and, and if there's more, um, you know, check cashing outfits than there are, um, you know, true neighborhood serving uh, wholesome businesses, uh, then, then we're, it's probably, the, I would say the pike is not achieving its full potential and that is the ultimate goal here. So thank you very much for bringing this forward and for the work. Well said and you know, another observation that I wanted to make on this particular line and uh, it's actually appropriate, Mr. Imes, that you were here because I think you were at the table when we dealt with the relocation issue surrounding the food star grocery store and um, you know, that was very helpful for me in understanding a few things. One, there's a lot that you can provide by way of counsel, help, uh, services, just to remind people for that. Uh, AED almost served as a broker, looking at every available space within the, the, the submarket and surrounding area to try to figure out something that was suitable. And it, eventually it just became that there was nothing that quite fit the needs of Food Star in Arlington, but there was something in Alexandria that um, has in fact turned out to work better for them. So they, they willingly uh, at the end left, even though they were in the position of being displaced for, for redevelopment, they found an option that was better for them. And as we, we structure this assistance, I, I think we have to, what's, what's also gonna make it hard is, is recognizing that there are gonna be some businesses that decide of their own a better opportunity will exist for me elsewhere. And we wanna make sure we're not losing taxpayer dollars to facilitate that. <laughs> you know, that's not what I'm interested in at all, um, but it's really figuring out and defining what is that business that has been served by Arlington and that is a valued part of the Arlington community that were it not for this redevelopment would happily stay where they are. Is there something that we can do to ease their temporary transition and permanent relocation back. Easy to articulate, hard to execute, 
but you have, I think, clear guidance from us that we want you to solve it. So done. <laughs> done. Well, I'll just add and advertise that um, we do provide those support services to, to businesses throughout the county. And in just speaking with our BizLaunch staff, um, some of the businesses that have been assisted along the pike lately are Pan, Ama Pan American Bakery, uh, Lost Dog Cafe, Dama Bakery, Trinity School, Torta C Tacos, New Ethiopian Cafe, and Mega Mart, um, just to, to name a few. And that does not even include uh, several of the office tenants that we have assisted through the business investment group. Um, and, the, and you mentioned the forms of assistance that we provide, whether it's through our core biz launch staff or our uh, uh, five or six different score counselors who specialize in, in leasing or uh, access to capital or you know, how to, how to get um, your, you know, other, other resources that you may need for relocation. So we really do have um, quite a bit going on, but it, like Mark said, sometimes we're, we find ourselves backpedaling in those situations and it would be great to, you know, to, to reach out and our staff has done that, for example, at, at Westmont Shopping Center with that upcoming redevelopment. It's almost as if you had your Rolodex right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, so that is all we have for you. I think we have clear guidance. I think next yes. steps will just be to, do you want to address next steps? No, I mean, I, our goal is, I think, to wrap up and have final decisions on anything related to uses or zoning or anything, you know, uh, by the second quarter. Um, and so we're going to try to meet that deadline and we'll give you, come back to you with updates. Okay, okay terrific. All right, so colleagues, with that, we are only nine minutes behind, behind the idealized schedule for where we would finish. And given that we did two work sessions today, that is an accomplishment to which you all should be very proud. So at this point, we'll bring the work session to a close, and I would now like to make the following motion to move us into a closed meeting. I move that the county board convene a closed meeting as authorized by Virginia Code Section 2.2, 3711A1 for the purpose of discussing personnel matters relating to the performance of one appointee of the county board and to the appointment of specific indivi individuals by the county board. Is there a second? second? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. We are in closed session.